Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm starting to feel like this is just, uh, you know, same old, same old. <laughs> but I have some extra stuff to show you today. I'm uh, gonna walk you through the parts of the hearing where they're addressing the third party culprit defense. And you guys know me, <clears throat> I do deep dive stuff. <clears throat> so I took a look at you know, what, what some of the law is and, and uh, stuff like that, just to kind of give some flavor to, to my reactions that I had when I was, uh, when I was watching these videos. So uh, it might be a little bit of a learning curve once again, to be able to share this stuff with you, but bear with me and uh, hopefully we'll get some good information out to you about what to make of this whole argument about the third party culprit defense. Um, so I want to start first by just giving the 10,000 foot overview of this case for those of you who may be new to it. Um, so first off, I want to say that there is a lot of detail <laughs> that has been put into the public record through the course of, of this, this litigation. Uh, the parties have been making a lot of press conferences, statements to the press and things like that as well. So there is a lot of stuff out there. I am not going to claim to be 100% familiar with all of it at this point in time. Uh, there's there's just a lot uh, and I, I am still kind of in catching up mode. Um, but I want to give you just the, the broad outline of what this case is about. So this involves the death of a Boston police officer named John O'Keefe. And what happened is that in the early morning hours, about six o'clock in the morning on January 29th of 2022, John O'Keefe's body was found in the front yard of another police officer, a gentleman named Brian Albert. And uh, there had apparently been a party the night before. Uh, it started at a, a bar in the town of Canton, Massachusetts, where this, this all took place, uh, and then moved to the home of, of Brian Albert. So there are a number of law enforcement witnesses, friends, uh, people like that, uh, who, who were in attendance at this party. Now, the Alberts are apparently fairly well-known, established people in the community, well, well connected. Uh, and that has arguably, according to some people, uh, maybe had a little bit of an influence on how this case has come about. So the general outline of what happened as far as what's not in dispute, it seems to not be in dispute that on the night of January the 28th, John O'Keefe was out at a bar with his girlfriend, Karen Reed, uh, and had a few drinks. They ran into uh, people that they knew, their acquaintances uh, at this bar, one of whom was a woman named Jennifer McCabe. And so after, you know, th things are winding down at the bar, they've decided to move this party. Uh, Jennifer McCabe invites uh, Mr. O'Keefe and Karen Reed over to this party at the Alberts house. And so this is happening at about, you know, 12, about midnight. Uh, and so there are some text messages back and forth between Mr. O'Keefe and, uh, Ms. McCabe, uh, basically like giving the address for, for where to go and instructions to, to get there, that type of thing. Um, so, Apparently, the car, according to everybody, uh, Karen Reed, you know, is driving in, in her SUV, drives to the Alberts house, and then uh, leaves. According to her, she drops off uh, John O'Keefe there at the house. Uh, but according to the people at the house, John O'Keefe never arrives. And so that's basically the last that, that John O'Keefe uh, is, is seen alive, undisputed. Now, uh, later that morning, uh, it's, it's getting to be late and, uh, Karen Reed, uh, is starting to panic because John hasn't come home. And this is apparently very uncharacteristic. Uh, he's got, um, just, just a, a variety of reasons why he, you, they would normally expect that, that he would have come home. He hasn't come home. 
So she's go going out to look for him, uh, goes to his house. He's not there. Uh, and she eventually calls Jen McCabe to tell her, you know, he, he's not there. He hasn't come home. So Jen McCabe and uh, Karen Reed then go together along with a, a, a third person who's picked up along the way. And they are, you know, basically looking for John O'Keefe. They go back to the house, the Albert's house where the party was held. And as they're driving up now, it's about six in the morning. Uh, Karen Reed apparently is able to see something from the vehicle, tells them, you know, I see him. They get out of the car and John O'Keefe is there uh, in the front yard, um, unconscious. So, and, and, you know, he's bloody. He's not in, in very good shape. There is a snowstorm that's going on at this point in time. Uh, it's a little bit unclear to me exactly when the snowstorm started, how bad the snowstorm was, how much snow has accumulated, and that type of thing. Uh, but apparently a snowplow has made at least one pass uh, through this road uh, because there seem to be snow banks. So... John O'Keefe is, is discovered, his body is discovered, and uh, first responders are, are called. Um, Karen is trying to give him CPR, but she is, uh, you know, freaking out, I think is probably a, a fair way to put it, which I think is fairly normal. I mean, you know, if I, if I found somebody I cared about, you know, dead in the grass somewhere, I'd probably be a little freaked out too, so. <clears throat> That's the general gist of what's happened. Uh, so John O'Keefe, he's unable to be revived. He, he passes away and his cause of death is listed on his medical record as undetermined. Um, so they have not specifically identified, was this uh, a homicide? Was this an accidental death uh, or, or anything like that? Undetermined. Police and the prosecutors, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in this case, they their theory of the case is that Karen Reed uh, killed John O'Keefe by backing into him with her car. And according to them, this uh, caused damage to her taillight. They subsequently recovered pieces of taillight from uh, the, the place where he was found a couple days later after his body had uh, had initially been, been recovered. Uh, and essentially relying on statements that, that she's made, kind of her, her demeanor at the time, uh, reports of, of interviews with, with witnesses who say that Karen Reed had made statements like, uh, I hit him, I hit him. So the defense, however, is disputing this version of events. The defense version of events is that John O'Keefe did actually go inside the house, the Alpert's house. And uh, while inside, he was beaten up uh, apparently pretty badly uh, and was then essentially thrown outside uh, in the grass where he was left to die. And they have marshaled what appears to be some fairly compelling evidence to support this theory. Uh, from the very beginning, there have been things that the defense has, has raised concerning discrepancies in the different witness accounts. Um, for example, one witness uh, who was interviewed had described that she first learned about John O'Keefe's death at <clears throat> about five in the morning or something because she had received a missed call from Jen McCabe. Uh, and her explanation was that it, that woke her up and she then got in contact with Jen McCabe. And that's how she learned that uh, John O'Keefe had died. The problem with that explanation, though, is that John O'Keefe's body was not discovered until six o'clock in the morning. Nobody knew that John O'Keefe was dead, uh, you know, when this when this phone call was supposedly made. There are a lot of shenanigans with uh, Jen McCabe and her communications uh, around the time of, of uh, the early morning hours between the midnight leaving from the bar and the 6 a.m. when uh, when John O'Keefe's body is found. Uh, she has deleted call records for a number of calls made to different witnesses, uh, people present at the time. 
uh, dur during this whole uh, this whole time frame. And there were some Google searches that uh, forensic analysis recovered from her phone that uh, look a little suspicious. Uh, Two twenty seven, I believe, a.m. one for uh, misspelled "how long to die in the cold." Uh, which doesn't look very good. And then uh, that search repeated again at, at uh, about 6.30 in the morning, the, the following morning, half an hour after his body is found. How long to die in the cold? And then also um, how long to digest food? Which is a little suspicious because that's one of the things that medical examiners will look at in attempting to establish a time of death is, you know, what, what are the contents of the person's stomach and how long would the digestive process have been in place? So uh, those kind of raised some eyebrows about, you know, why, why, why would you be Googling these things? Um, so this, this is, again, I'm, I'm not trying to get super granular with like every single detail of the defense theory, uh, but one of the big pieces of information <clears throat> that's since come out is that the, the feds are also investigating the situation. And this is kind of raising eyebrows because the feds don't normally investigate just a, a small town homicide. There's no, there's no federal link to that. Um, it's not like a, a you know, major crime. It's not interstate in, in application or whatever. So what on earth are they involved for? Well, according to Karen Reed's defense attorney, uh, the FBI is investigating the district attorney of Norfolk County, Massachusetts, uh, Michael Morrissey. So he's the one that ultimately pressed charges, presented the case to the grand jury and got the indictment for first degree murder against Karen Reed. And this is because a, a lot of these shenanigans uh, are suggesting that there may have been, I mean, co cover up is, is sort of the nice way to put it. Uh, but I mean, li literally things like evidence being destroyed. Uh, there's been some indication that the DA uh, potentially told one of the witnesses, another law enforcement officer who was present at the scene, uh, that he should go ahead and destroy his cell phone, even though the judge in this case had already entered, she'd already signed an order saying you need to preserve all of your communications for this, this time period. Uh, the DA apparently told him, go, go ahead and destroy it anyway. So he, he drives it out and like hammered, goes like full Hillary Clinton on his cell phone, right? Like destroys the, the SIM card and everything. So that's a little bit wild. Um, a lot of Stuff like that uh, involving, you know, basically getting getting rid of evidence, evidence uh, not being recovered, things like, um, you know, video for uh, along this uh, along this uh, route where Karen Reed's vehicle had been towed from her home to the police station. Remember, the police said that they recovered uh, pieces of a taillight from outside. Uh, the house where where John John O'Keefe was discovered, uh, but that wasn't the same. That wasn't the same day. That was like a, a day or so later uh, after they recovered his body. And so you might wonder, well, why why hadn't they seen that? Why didn't they recover that and document that the first time they were there? The defense theory is because they planted it, and the defense claims to have uh, video footage from uh, a Ring doorbell camera that shows Karen Reed's tail light at about five that morning and that it was intact. So the defense is arguing that sometime between uh, when they towed her car, when police had exclusive custody of her car, took it to the police station and, and you know, had a search warrant for it and stuff, that uh, they had broken the tail light basically and, and then gone in and planted this evidence. So there's allegations here of some pretty significant misconduct on the part of police uh, that, you know, if, if that has happened, I mean, this is pretty egregious. That's pretty bad stuff. And I guess it maybe wouldn't be all that surprising that uh, the feds would be involved in investigating that. So 
again, I'm not trying to get granular with everything, but I, I wanted to give you enough to give you a sense of why this case uh, certainly caught my attention. It's caught a lot of people's attention uh, because of the cover-up angle, the corruption angle um, that at least if we take the defense and, and a lot of what's been presented here at face value, uh, it, it looks, you know, like nothing to sniff at. Okay. So that's what we're expecting to come out at the trial, which is scheduled to start tomorrow. Jury selection is uh, supposed to start tomorrow. So with that, uh, what was going on with these hearings last week uh, was on Friday, the judge was hearing motions in limine. And so motions in limine are typically uh, preliminary rulings that the judge makes on the conduct of the trial and often the admissibility or inadmissibility of certain kinds of evidence. So there were a number of motions before the court. Uh, I'm not really going to get into a lot of them. Uh, the judge did indicate she is she's only ruled on like a couple simple ones and uh, otherwise she reserved her ruling on the motions, which is pretty common. And we'll talk a little bit about why as, as we get into the video. So we're going to focus real specifically on the third party culprit defense stuff, because essentially what's, what this is, is the state filed a motion arguing that the defense should not be able to put on any of this evidence that somebody other than Karen Reed may have committed this crime. And it's one of these areas of the law, the third party defense, we call it the SODI defense sometimes, S-O-D-D-I, some other dude did it. And uh, it's one of these areas where it gets a little bit of special treatment in the law sometimes. Like, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to explain why that is because you might think, well, if the if the defense has evidence, they they should be able to just bring that out, right? Uh, you should be able to to uh, use that as as you would use anything that tends to show reasonable doubt in the in the crime. And that is generally the case, but there is just a lot of nuance when it gets into the specifics of what exactly you're trying to offer and why, what does it tend to show? So that's what we're gonna talk about as we look through this hearing on the state's effort to keep this third party perpetrator stuff out. We're gonna look at some of that case law some of those reasonings and, uh, Ultimately, I'm going to give you my takeaway on where I think this is all going to go once we get to trial. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get the video pulled up here and see if I can get that started. Let's go. Um, but first, so I'm reviewing the motions in Lemonade. I mean, clearly the defendant has an absolute right, a constitutional right, to present a third party culprit defense, but counsel is well aware that that is not without limit, right, from the case law. Now, defendant has stood here, defense counsel has stood in this court repeatedly, um, stood here and in other venues and in the pleadings, espousing various third party culprit um, theories or scenarios. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop right here because, uh, just to pause, because I am already picking up on some hostility <laughs> from the judge towards this third party presentation stuff. Now, couple couple of initial impressions of the judge. So first off, I'm aware there is some background information with this judge. Uh, she is a former defense attorney. Uh, which, you know, normally is, is going to get you some kudos in my book. That's not the normal pathway to the bench. Normally prosecutors end up on the bench. Uh, so her background is, is in defense, which I, I find uh, somewhat interesting. However, there have apparently been some public statements made that sort of call into question whether she is impartial and unconnected from this entire situation. Uh, specifically, one of the members of the McCabe family uh, made some, some type of public statement on Twitter uh, against uh, Turtle Boy, um, Aiden Kearney, who is, uh, who's been reporting on a lot of this for, for quite some period of time. I'm not going to get super into the Turtle Boy stuff either, so 
I just want to stick with the with the case for the most part. Uh, but this just came up because uh, this McCabe individual, this member of the family, had made a comment to the effect that he was going to bury Turtle Boy under uh, what his reference to the judge is Auntie Bev. He refers to the judge as Auntie Bev. He's going to bury Turtle Boy under the porch at Auntie Bev's beach house. Uh, and basically just making these statements that uh, seem to indicate there are, you know, personal social types of connections uh, between Auntie Bev, Judge Canoni, and uh, some of the witnesses in this case. So, you know, this is a little bit of a tough one because, you know, judges aren't required to be social pariahs. They don't have to be completely isolated misfits in order to do their jobs. They are entitled to have a social life, but that sure gets awful sticky when people that you have relationships with are involved in and, you know, potentially implicated in cases before you. Now, I think there's probably no question that if it was one of those people that were charged and were sitting in her courtroom as a defendant, she would probably need to recuse herself. Uh, it's, it's a standard of um, uh, impartial, reasonable perception of impartiality. It's not like you don't have to prove the judge is actually biased in some way. With a judge, you typically just have to prove that if a person, a reasonable objective person looking at this situation saw these facts, could come up with the impression that the judge might have a bias here, then, then the judge needs to step down because it's just really important to maintain the, the image of the court as, as being impartial and disconnected. So if one of these people were the defendant, probably she's going to have to recuse, but they're not the defendant. They're witnesses in the case. And so at least in theory, they don't face any kind of special jeopardy that uh, her rulings or whatnot could potentially affect. So it's, you know, a bit of a gray area with, with her being on this case. Uh, understand a lot of people don't love it, uh, and I can, I can completely understand that. Uh, but as far as the letter of the law goes, yeah, it's probably squarely within, within the letter of the law. It's just one of those situations where, uh, you know, you, 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 might, you might hope that the judge would, would do things a little bit differently. So that's the background on Judge Canoni here, Auntie Bev. My initial impression of her just in general um, because this is happening at the very start of the hearing and you get a little bit of an insight into her personality and, and kind of how she operates as a judge. Uh, so there are a lot, judges have all kinds of different styles on the bench, right? I mean, obviously everybody's got a different personality, so you might expect that. Uh, but a big distinction is, is that some judges will come in and they are like super in control of the courtroom. They run the docket, they call the cases, they decide what we're talking about and when, whose turn it is and, and so forth. They're very much in control of the process. Other judges are a lot more laissez-faire. I mean, I've been in courtrooms where the judge literally just sits there on the bench and the, the people that are there on the docket for that day, they just sort of mill about in the well on the other side of the bar and figure out between themselves, like, who's going first and what are you talking about? And, and you know, when the cases get called and stuff like that, the judge just kind of waits for the other people to serve up the hearing for them. So that is clearly not Judge uh, Judge Canoni. She has walked into this courtroom and decided instantly that the first thing we are going to do is start talking to the parties, not to hear the motion, but to tell them what I'm thinking about with respect to this third party culprit stuff. So uh, she's got this control demeanor very much in her courtroom. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's just something I note that uh, I expect we're going to kind of see more of as this case gets into trial and she is sort of put in a position of being in charge of deciding how things are going to unfold. So let's continue. Um, but now that it's time to actually try the case in the courtroom, I don't have a motion from the defense to admit third party culprit. 
uh, testimony. So, and as you're well aware, I have to make findings before any third party, any mention of any third party culprit evidence or even an opening goes before the jurors. Um, going to stop right here because now is where we are going to start looking at, at some other stuff. Don't have a motion from the defense to admit third party culprit. And I have to make rulings before any of this can come up. Well, I thought, really, where does that requirement come from? Uh, I don't necessarily see that in the law. So I wanted to go ahead and take a look. So I found a couple of things. The first thing here is uh, the, the criminal rule 14, which is the, the pretrial discovery rule, the mandatory disclosures basically that the parties have to make to each other. And so I, I looked through this rule and, and it's, it's fairly typical. Um, most of the burdens are on the prosecutor uh, for a lot of reasons, because of Brady, because the prosecutor has the burden of proof and so forth but also because the defense has certain privileges. They don't necessarily have to disclose, for example, if the defendant is going to testify. And if the defendant is going to testify, what exactly is the defendant going to say? Uh, that type of thing, they, they often get to keep you know, close to the vest. So the defense theory uh, is not something that generally is going to have to be disclosed. So in this, under this particular rule, from an evidence standpoint, uh, there's these three specific things that they have to uh, give to the prosecutor. They have to give the names and information about their witnesses. They have to provide information about experts and uh, about uh, testimony, any kind of like if they got expert scientific tests, things like that, they have to produce that to the state. And then any and all promises, rewards, or inducements made to the witnesses. This typically applies, applies to the prosecutor because it's things like, um, you know, I cut you a deal. Like you're going to, you know, get, you're going to skate on some charges you otherwise, you know, are getting charged with because you're cooperating as an informant. Uh, but it also applies to the defense for things like what did you pay your experts? What's their rate of pay? Uh, because for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, I guess that's impeachable, you know, prosecutors like to bring it up. I mean, as if, you know, some PhD or something is going to show up in court just for free to testify. I mean, of course they're getting paid. Uh, but that's used to just basically show, well, you know, you you have, you have a motive to testify in favor of the party who is, who's paying you money. So there are then, as you go through this rule, there are some special things that you have to do with certain types of defenses. Um, and so notice of alibi, you have to provide pre-notice of that. Mental health defenses, you have to, to provide prior notice of that. You have to go through these specific examination procedures. Uh, and you know that can all get very complicated. Notice of other defenses, if the defendant intends to rely upon a defense based on a license, claim of authority, or ownership, or exemption, there's specific notice requirements there, that's typically getting to like theft crimes or uh, possession, of, possession of stolen property. Uh, I could see it being a, a situation where if it's like possession of a controlled substance, you actually have a prescription, uh, so that's a, a claim of authority. Uh, so the, these are fairly specific and really not applicable in this particular case. And then self-defense, if you're going to provide a, a self-defense defense, defense uh, that is something that under these rules, you have to provide uh, notice to the court ahead of time and you know give them your, your witnesses and things like that. But that's it. Those are the only ones. There's nothing in here about third party culprit defense has to be disclosed you know, prior to the state. So, the judge is not getting it from rule 14. Well, there is a second rule here, if I can get to it. Uh, one second, I think I gotta do this. All right, here we go. Evidence rule 1105. This is dealing specifically with third party culprit evidence. And so, 
Here's what it says. Evidence that a third party committed the crimes charged against the defendant or had the motive, intent, and opportunity to commit the crimes is admissible provided that the evidence has substantial probative value. In making this determination, the court must make a preliminary finding that the evidence is relevant, is not too remote or speculative, and will not tend to prejudice or confuse the jury. If the evidence is otherwise inadmissible, the court must also find that there are substantial connecting links between the crime charged and a third party or between the crime charged and another crime that could not have been committed by the defendant. So this is a little bit of weird language, but it's just dealing with the fact that historically, most of these uh, third party culprit cases have come up in one of two contexts, mistaken identity or proof of a similar crime by, you know, some, some unrelated person. And so that, that's, that's, that's just sort of, sort of the, the situation that the rule is contemplating there, but it's really not the situation that we're dealing with in this particular case. Now, whenever I look at the rules, okay, when they give me notes like this, notes to the rules, this, this, is, this is where the meat is, because this really tells you, you know, what, what, is, what is going on here? How did these rules develop? Why did these rules exist? So there's a whole bunch of case law down here in these notes that kind of shed some light on what's going on with this third party defense stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll give you just sort of the, the general overview here, which is that there's two ways that this gets approached in, in Massachusetts. One is a straight third party culprit defense. I am going to point the finger at a third party and say that person did it. The other way is through what they call a Bowdoin defense, and that's based on a case, uh, Commonwealth versus Bowdoin, that uh, I'm going to pull up for you guys to, to show in a little bit. Uh, but that is dealing with an argument that uh, a defense theory that the police knew of an alternative suspect and failed to take reasonable steps to investigate it. So these are both different avenues that extremely similar evidence can, can come in that would tend to suggest somebody other than the defendant committed the crime. But there's kind of different standards that apply to them. Uh, both of these defenses implicate your constitutional right to present a, present a defense. You always have the right to, to present a defense. But when you're dealing with third-party culprit stuff, courts have put special limits on it uh, for a few different reasons. The main one is that they don't, they just don't want the distraction if the defense is going to get into go into court and say something like, uh, but this guy didn't like the victim, therefore maybe he did it. The, the the reason why they don't really want that is because maybe he did it doesn't really tend to prove that he did do it. Uh, it just kind of, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, that's a high accuse somebody of, of doing something. I mean, that's, 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 you should have a little bit more than just, well, he could have been that guy. I mean, it could have been anybody. So it doesn't help you sort out who the actual person was. And one of the related reasons for that, it too, is because uh, they don't want the state, the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did the crime. The state does not have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that every other person on the planet did not commit the crime. And so if you just throw it out, well, this person could have done it, it runs the risk of opening up these collateral issues where now the, the state is going to have to knock that down and is going to have to put on a whole case about, you know, why didn't that other person do it? So that's the general reason behind there being limits on the admission of third party culprit evidence. Uh, they don't want it to be distracting. They, they want it to have some kind of substance and they don't want the state to have to disprove that, you know, everybody else in the, in the world who could have done it, you know, did it. Uh, they want it to be limited to situations where there's actually a pretty good reason to think that a third party did it.
And so because of that, under the Massachusetts case law, to present evidence, point the finger at somebody and say that person did it, you have to present mo uh, evidence of motive, the fact that they would want to do it, intent that they did it on purpose, and opportunity that they, they could have done it. It was, um, you know, they didn't have an alibi. They, they, uh, there are circumstances that tend to suggest that they could have been the perpetrator. When you look at the cases, um, you know, you get all kinds of different factual scenarios where this, this kind of stuff comes up. Um, so, you know, some of them are, some of them are pretty strong. Some of them are pretty weak. Um, and we'll get into that, uh, in, in a little bit. So the reason why we started down this road and took the pause in the hearing is because the judge said, you didn't file a motion to admit it. Well, it's not real clear that they have to do that. Uh, this motion doesn't say that. This rule doesn't say that. What the rule does say is that if you're going to admit, if you're going to point the finger at a third party uh, with, with some evidence, that evidence has to be pre-qualified, meaning, yes, the judge does have to make preliminary rulings about that. But here's the thing. Uh, any particular piece of evidence, it can often be admitted for a whole different variety of reasons. Uh, it can be admissible to impeach your, your the, the state's witnesses. And frankly, I expect that's how a lot of this information is ultimately going to come before the jury in this particular case. It's not going to be because the state is going to call a witness and say, you know, what about these texts you deleted or whatever? It's because the state's going to be calling those witnesses and then it's going to come up in cross-examination. Oh, by the way, you know, what about this Google search that you did at 2.27 in the morning? Uh, so you're always allowed to impeach, to challenge the state's case. You don't have to pre-qualify it with, uh, with, with anything like that. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, to me, this, this suggestion that the defense had an obligation to bring a motion at this point in time, it, it really doesn't fly. They have a lot of ways they can introduce this evidence. They don't have to get prior approval for all of those reasons. Another reason is because uh, cases, they, they like evolve as they go on. And I'm sure as you know, if you've followed trials, watch trials, uh, often by like week three, you're in a completely different place <laughs> than you thought you were going to be when you, when you went into it on day one. We're, we're four weeks down the road you know, by, by the timeline estimate from the defense, even putting on a single witness. And so there is a lot that can happen that can evolve in the state's case and stuff like that uh, over that course of time. The defense witnesses could open the door to a whole bunch of this stuff. Uh, and then potentially uh, the defense doesn't have to, you know, put on a, a special case to, to present any, any of the evidence at all. The last thing I just want to mention, too, is that with these evidentiary rulings like this, particularly rulings that implicate the right to present a defense, your ruling on a motion in limine is almost always characterized as preliminary. This is a preliminary, it's a tentative ruling. This is not a final ruling. And in fact, a lot of places, I don't, I don't know for sure about Massachusetts, but in a lot of places, in my, in my case, in my state, for example, uh, if you are a defense attorney, your evidence gets excluded in limine. You can't appeal that. It's not a final ruling. You have to then still offer this evidence at trial, get a ruling from the judge confirming, yes, you're not allowed to bring this in. And that's what makes it final. That's what then you're allowed to appeal. Because again, the situation could have changed. There could have been a better foundation laid for it. Uh, the details of what's presented could have become more clear to the judge since in a motion in limine, you're just getting kind of a, a summary from, from the parties. You're not getting the accumulation of the evidence over time that, that happens in great detail in a trial. So a lot of those things can change the calculus of whether this stuff is admissible or not. So that's why in, in limine rulings are, are preliminary. And so as a practical matter, that means the only thing that, that is really important 
uh, for purposes of, of getting that ruling is what's the situation at the moment when I want to put it in front of the jury? That's the time when, you know, for certain it needs to be, it needs to be pre-qualified. But again, you could have, you could have had a lot of different reasons for already offering, uh, this, this particular evidence and, and so forth. Now, uh, the judge has implied that to be able to raise this in opening argument, uh, it has to be pre-qualified. I am not 100% convinced that that is the case. And the reason why is because third-party culprit, you're talking about two different things. You're talking about specific pieces of evidence, but you're talking about a defense theory. And so defense theories you don't have to pre-qualify those. There's no rule that says in order to make a particular argument to the jury, uh, you have to you have to get permission, you know, from the judge ahead of time. You do if you're going to talk about evidence that is anticipated to be presented. If that evidence would otherwise have to be pre-qualified, well, then yeah, you have to get the judge's permission before you can say in your opening statement the evidence is going to show that. Uh, you know, such and such a witness uh, contradicted himself at the grand jury uh, proceeding in, in front of the federal government if you don't otherwise have a basis to, to be able to put that in. So uh, you can argue a theory and then fail to present any evidence to support it. And in fact, that's kind of a gift to the state if that happens, because then you get to closing and the state gets to go back and say, look, remember what they said to you in closing argument that you were going to hear about this theory? And as it turns out, there was like no evidence supporting that. That's not putting the state in a bad position if that were to happen. So again, I'm not convinced that for them to be able to say somebody, somebody besides Karen Reed did this crime, uh, that you have to have some pre-qualified, you know, evidence to be able to do that. That's just kind of standard defense work. If you're saying my client didn't do it, then necessarily somebody else did. So yeah, that's just given me a little bit of pause about um, our judge, our judge Bev here. So let's go ahead and go back now and uh, continue on with this part of the hearing. You know, in order to admit it, and given that I have no information at all, I mean, I don't know who the third party culprit is, even after reading 4,500 pages of discovery. I don't know what motive a, a third party culprit might have. I don't know how it's relevant. I don't know if it's remote or if it's current. I don't know if it's speculative um, or if it's relevant. I don't know if it will prejudice uh, or confuse the jury. And if it's hearsay, I have a whole other series of factors I have to consider. So, Mr. Yanetti, are you pursuing a third party culprit defense? Uh, we are, Your Honor, and I'm prepared to address that. The Commonwealth has raised the issue and I am prepared to address that today. So you filed your motions first and you did not raise it. So if the Commonwealth had not raised it, you did not move to introduce it, correct? I have no motion from No, I from understand, you about I, it. I understand, Your Honor. Um, if you'd like something in writing for us, we can do that. I have a full argument prepared. All right, so who is the third party culprit? We, we are under no obligation to name any specific third party culprit. How am I supposed, so you're prepared to argue all this? I'm prepared to argue it, Jeff. All right, so we will get to that when we get to the Commonwealth's motion. That's fine. Now, the, the second thing I want to address. Okay, so we're, we're going to go ahead and, and pause it there because obviously we're going to come back to it uh, later. And that's what we're going to go ahead and look at next. But so, I mean, I think the defense being a little bit uncomfortable with the things that she's asking uh, is reflective of my, my own kind of sense of discomfort uh, with what she's asking because the nature of their defense here, it, it's its really twofold. It's not so much that they're saying we have proof that a specific person, you know, is, is the one who did the murder. Uh, their argument is that basically one of these people who was at this party, uh, you know, could have been the one to do it. And there was a broader conspiracy 
with law enforcement and with the people who were present at, uh, at the time to cover that up. And so that's not necessarily like there's just there's a lot of overlap there. And when the defense is putting on a defense that you guys didn't investigate it, you didn't rule out uh, different perpetrators like we like we pointed out from this Bowdoin case, uh, that doesn't get subject to this this rule like these these same types of considerations that goes to impeachment of law enforcement for bias. And bias is one of these things that's like pretty, it's kind of untouchable. <laughs> you know, if you, if you have a good argument that the point that you want to make uh, goes to bias, then chances are you're, you're going to be able to make it if, if uh, you know, if, it, if it's, you're not, if you're not just like completely making up, you know, a, a, an out there argument, uh, if there's a viable connection between what you're trying to present and how that tends to shed light on somebody's uh, perspective, then yeah, chances are that's going to be admissible. So he wouldn't have to get preclearance for any of this stuff if his entire point is to just say, law enforcement didn't investigate this crime. And why didn't they investigate this crime? Because they're connected with all the people who are the, who are the true perpetrators. Uh, or, I mean, they don't even have to get to the true perpetrators, just they're connected to the people who are the owners of the house where this happened and they would have an incentive to, you know, not be dragged into the process, not be placed under suspicion, et cetera. So there were kind of special dispensations given, uh, the, the police conducted themselves in a way in this investigation that they wouldn't normally conduct an investigation had this not involved the Alberts, had this not involved other law enforcement uh, witnesses. Uh, this had just been, you know, Joe, Joe Schmo that they had no connection with, they would have behaved differently. So it doesn't even have to go to because these people uh, perpetrated the crime. It can literally just be because of their, because of their connection here, they failed to rule out alternative possibilities. So yeah, uh, the judge seems to be setting up this kind of impossible standard where the defense has to know ahead of time exactly what piece of evidence they're offering for exactly what piece of you know, piece of the theory exactly you know which angle of attack they're taking on the state's case the flat out is there a third party perpetrator uh, that you know <laughs> whoa <laughs> like talk about putting you on the spot uh, I tend to think the defense attorney's right here they don't have to say unless that is something that they're going to present at trial if they're going to say uh, you know, we, we think, we think, uh, so-and-so is, is the perpetrator. Then again, at that point, that's the point where you go to the bench and say, okay, you know, I'm about to do this. Is it going to be allowed or is it not going to be allowed? You don't necessarily have to do that, you know, on the Friday before you, you've even gotten started for trial. So, they do, of course, as we know, come back to this uh, motion at a later time. And so that is what we are going to turn to next. All right, so as you know, third party culprit and Bowden are often argued together, often presented together. Why don't we just deal with the two motions together. So Commonwealth's file, you're, you're number 30 and 31, um, Mr. Lally. Um, Mr. Yannetti, are you arguing both? Does it make sense I to think, sort of keep them together? I agree that they should be kept together. Yeah. All right, so why don't I hear you as to your concerns on both? And, and as you know, sometimes third party culprit as it goes to Bowden is different than just straight third party culprit. And actually, it might save us a lot of time. Is that what you intend to do, Ms. Tianetti? Third party culprit as it well, goes to Bowden or straight third party culprit as well? Definitely third party culprit as it goes to Bowden, that's for sure. Um, and then depending on how the evidence develops at trial, um, there may be uh, you know, an, uh, an offer to offer third party culprit evidence with regard to third party culprits. But I think I can. So, I mean, that's exactly what we just said, right? It depends on what comes out at trial. The defense theory is clearly at this point, we are going to impeach the, the, the 
police investigation for purposes of showing reasonable doubt. You can't rely on the state's theory of the case because they didn't rule out uh, other potential theories when they didn't follow these other, you know, expected uh, investigative leads. So he's absolutely right here. You don't have to litigate that now. You can wait and see how the evidence at trial emerges. And then if it sounds like you've got a reason to point the finger at somebody in particular, then you can do it. It can happen that one of the state's witnesses, you know, can volunteer. Well, it was that guy. I mean, stranger things have happened in, in trial for sure. And that would completely change the calculus, the dynamic of the admissibility of, of any of these theories. So, uh, yeah, I think that is clearly a strategic call that they're making. It's very normal for the defense to hold their cards a little bit close. You have to reveal, obviously, your witnesses, your experts and stuff like that to the state. Uh, you can't, you know, completely like hide the bag or whatever. But you also don't have to tell them everything you're thinking about. Uh, and so, yeah, if, if you got an idea that comes up during the course of the trial or you think it might come up during the course of the trial, uh, that's your right. And you, you are absolutely entitled to keep that to yourself. I can speak further to that in response. So go ahead. You can argue these however you want to argue them. No, it, and, and I, I would argue them sort of in that vein, Your Honor. So understanding that... Um, based on the state of the evidence, uh, as I anticipate it to be, uh, and in any case, regardless, uh, I think a defendant in any criminal case has a much better um, um, shot, essentially, at getting evidence in regarding to Bowdoin as sort of a backdoor through, uh, excuse me, as to third party culprit as sort of a backdoor through uh, a Bowdoin defense. Uh, so what I'm primarily concerned with, Your Honor, is, is uh, motion to eliminate number 30, uh, because as the court is well aware, uh, there have been a number of, of theories of uh, sort of uh, speculation, rank speculation, uh, opinions uh, without any evidentiary support, uh, names of certain people that have been dropped at this microphone by counsel at different uh, pretrial hearings uh, who are not witnesses, who have nothing to do with this case, who don't know anything about this case, uh, who counsel when they said those names and sort of dropped those whatever they supported to be facts, uh, knew that they had nothing to say and nothing to do with this case. Um, what I'm uh, concerned about is whatever is acceptable as far as uh, uh, believability when it comes to arguing things in pretrial motions, shouting things from courthouse steps, or you know, bandying about on Twitter is, is not what we do here. Um, and so now it is a time where uh, counsel is going to be relegated to what is actual, admissible, relevant evidence. I'm just going to pause here because of the irony. Um, you guys know I'm a defense attorney. Uh, that's clearly the perspective that I bring to this case, to, to really any criminal case. And you just sort of get used to some kind of patterns, some habits of behavior and stuff like that, that are a little bit stereotypical. Obviously not everybody falls into these stereotypes on either the defense or the prosecution side, uh, but sometimes you just find a really good example of, of somebody fitting the stereotype. And the projection, the accusing the other people of the stuff that you did uh, is just a real common one uh, with the prosecutors because they're very aggressive. That's that's their whole mode. They jacuzzi, you know, they're the ones that are that are coming at you and trying to put you in jail. And so, uh, you know, defensiveness, if they are kind of in the wrong in, in any sort of way, can often take the form of, you know, pointing the finger. You're the bad guy. You're the one that did it and stuff like that. So I find this stuff with the, you can't shout stuff from the, the courthouse steps uh, in, in trial like the way you can with the press. I just find that really ironic because there had been motions in this case dealing with pretrial statements, uh, a press conference that the DA, uh, Mr. Morrissey, had given and uh, ultimately found that, well, he didn't, uh, he didn't go so far as to, you know, make it so unfair that he can't prosecute the case anymore. He's not going to get disqualified 
as the district attorney. Uh, but nevertheless, these statements are bad. They broke the line of the ethical rules of, of what the lawyers are supposed to say about a case that's pending. Uh, so to see now this guy, you know, up here pointing the finger, you, the defense, have been so bad with the press and you're going to do that in the in the in the courtroom, you know, as well. Well, you know, a two. <laughs> maybe take a little look in the mirror on that one. Uh, and what I'm uh, asking uh, for in this motion is for the de defendant through her counsel to actually provide any admissible or relevant evidence that pertains to third party culprit, which to this point they have not done. Uh, so if this is something that's going to be raised as an issue on its own, uh, as the court is well aware, what the uh, case law indicates is that the acts uh, of the other person are so closely connected in point of time and method of operation as to cast doubt upon the identification of the defendant as a person who committed the crime. It has to be specific. Um, it has to be uh, to at least a specific realm of person uh, or a specifically identified person uh, who would have motive opportunity uh, to commit uh, the act with which the defendant is charged. And up until this point, I have not seen anything uh, specific as to that. As it pertains uh, to uh, the bonus. I'm going to just go ahead and stop this here now, because uh, this is going to be a good point to, to look at what exactly it is that the defense has to show to present a third party perpetrator defense. Uh, and the reason why uh, he's not technically wrong with anything that he's saying, um, he's, oh, this is the wrong one, my bad. He's uh, he's correctly stating what the rule is, what what the legal standard is, and uh, you know he he's obviously trying to pitch the the defendant's case as as falling short of that standard based on what he knows about it. So let's talk about now what that standard actually is. Uh, so I have two cases here to, to share with you to kind of help flesh out what exactly this means to, to present third party culprit evidence. So the first one um, is this 2001 case from Massachusetts Supreme Court, Commonwealth v. Buckman. These both, by the way, are listed in the notes from that rule 1105, you know, one of the reasons why the meat's there and why it's always good to go look at that stuff. That's where you get the details. So in this particular case, uh, this was a situation where a, a woman is found uh, stabbed multiple times uh, in her bedroom upstairs and her husband is found down in the garage taped uh, to like a, a pole and his, he's got tape over, over his mouth and his eyes. A neighbor shows up and uh, finds them and uh, tells the police that uh, the wife is probably still inside the house. So they go look in, in the house. They find her there. Uh, later, however, in the course of the investigation, they find the wife's blood all over the husband, the guy who's been taped. And the, the police officer who's freeing him observes that, you know, this, this tape looked like it's kind of loose, like it didn't look like it was even necessarily really stuck to his skin. So the husband gets charged with the murder. And so at trial, here's the third party culprit evidence that he wanted to admit. At least three potential third party culprits, a serial killer released from prison in Georgia approximately two weeks before the murder in this case occurred. A neighbor of the Buckmans who had shot John Loder, the husband, uh, the uh, neighbor, this is the neighbor, the neighbor's dog while the dog was tied up in the Buckmans front yard sparking a lawsuit with John Loder, the, the, the guy who showed up. And Loder himself, who had made the initial report to police and who, after the police had failed to locate the victim in their initial search, advised them that the defendant's wife was likely to be in the master bedroom. So that's, that's their theory. Could have been the serial killer because the serial killer just got out of jail. It could have been this neighbor because this neighbor uh, shot a dog. And it could have been the guy who was the first one to arrive on the scene. So this case gives a lot of language about the standard. It's a time-honored method of defending against a criminal charge. A defendant may introduce evidence that tends to show that another person committed the crime or had the motive, intent, and opportunity to do it. 
We have given wide latitude to the admission of relevant evidence that a person other than the defendant may have committed the crime charged. But it's not unbounded latitude to, to present that stuff because it inevitably diverts jurors' attention away from the defendant on trial and onto the third party and essentially requires the Commonwealth to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the third party culprit did not commit the crime. So here we see, for example, what I was just talking about with the preliminary rulings being just preliminary. The judge didn't foreclose the possibility that you might be able to develop a basis to present this stuff at trial. He merely suggested that there was insufficient information to make a definitive ruling at that time and clearly indicated the door was still open to the defendant. So in this particular case, uh, you know, didn't, didn't say absolutely not, just basically said it's going to depend on what the evidence is. The evidence of the serial killer was not closely connected in point of time and method of operation as to cast doubt upon the identification of the person. The defendant could not place the serial killer in the vicinity at the time of the murder. Uh, and so basically like just the fact that there was a serial killer without more is, is not going to get you there. You would need to show uh, in this, this would be that line of cases I, I mentioned before where it comes up because there is like a, uh, uh, a fingerprint for the crime, so to speak, like a, a something specific about it, a similarity between different crimes that then allows you to say, well, hey, my guy probably didn't do it because it was probably this other guy who commits crimes exactly like this in, in other situations. So just the fact he's a serial killer and he, you know, got out is, is not going to be enough to get you there. That might get you opportunity, but it doesn't give you motive. It doesn't give you intent. The fact of tensions between the neighbor, the Buckmans, and Loader was not indicative of the neighbor's motive to kill. And the defendant offered and produced no evidence suggesting that the neighbor had any opportunity to kill beyond that possessed by any neighbor. So this, this is getting to the specific evidence that has to be present to show opportunity. Uh, you can't just be like, well, this person was alive, therefore they had the opportunity to commit the crime. No, that's not unique to that person. That's, that's going to apply to anybody, uh, anybody alive. So you got to have something a little bit more to suggest that's why it was this person and not just any particular person. And so the fact that you don't like your neighbor is typically not going to prove that you had a motive to kill your neighbor. Uh, that's just, that's not going to be enough. You would, you would need something more. You would need like evidence of, of, you know, confrontations, evidence of like increasing hostilities, a threat. I mean, anything along those lines is going to get you a lot closer to just, they fought over somebody else's dog. Finally, defense counsel opposed the Commonwealth's motion in limine based on the following evidence she expected to introduce regarding Loader. He had a key to the house. He found the defendant, but did not remove the duct tape. He did not telephone a neighbor, to help, neighbor for help, but instead drove to the police station. He worked for the defendant, knew of the defendant's football card gambling business, and knew there would be money in the house that day. Uh, Susan Buckman, the victim, the wife who was died, was afraid of Loder, having found at one point, found him on his hands and knees in the upstairs hall. And when he returned to the house, he told police officers that S Susan Buckman should be in the bedroom. Defense counsel also pointed out that the Commonwealth had failed to obtain any forensic evidence from Loder. Now, so this is getting closer, right? Because this is somebody who is on the scene uh, and, you know, okay, you pointed out she's, she's probably in the bedroom. I could just be a good guess, but it could also be, well, you, you know, you told them cause you knew. Um, and you know, okay. Found him on his hands and knees in the upstairs hall. That is a little bit weird. Okay. And there have been cases where stuff like that can sometimes be enough to get third party culprit evidence in. There was, um, one case that I looked at that involved a, a sex crime where uh, one of the alternative culprits um, had like previous, it was like a landlord and he'd previously been caught like pulling her underwear out of her lingerie drawer. I mean, something gross like that. But so it's, you know, fairly specific and a uh, little bit more evidence of specific motive. 
And that's really where this ultimately is going to fail because there just isn't specific enough motive here for him to be the one that did it. So it says uh, there was no evidence that he had motive or intent to commit the crime. Uh, even evidence that the victim feared Loader because she once discovered him on his hands and knees in the upstairs hall is inadmissible hearsay. It does not tend to show that Loader killed the victim and the evidence could have confused the jury. We're going to come back to the inadmissible hearsay uh, in a little bit. But so this is a situation where, okay, th this, this does not meet the standard, okay? And I, I share, you, share this with you to just kind of give you a little bit of a, of a benchmark for what, you know, this, this is not good enough. This is what is not going to meet the standard. A serial killer happens to be on the loose. A neighbor had an argument with the guy. And the first guy who showed up at the scene was previously, you know, in the house doing something weird. Uh, so it must be him. It's not specific enough. So this is going to matter when we get back to the hearing and we see the defense telling us uh, what it is that they're looking at that uh, they want they want uh, to be able to share with the jury. So let's go back to the hearing. Uh, motion the Commonwealth filed. What the Commonwealth is asking for there is, is notice and, and voir dire in relation uh, to a vote in defense. So if there is, uh, again, going to be some, you know, it, it's, I don't think the evidence comes anywhere close uh, to a Bowdoin instruction, uh, but certainly uh, what the courts have said uh, over time uh, is that uh, a Bowdoin defense is something that uh, if the evidence warrants it, uh, counsel can uh, elicit testimony in regard to it uh, or attempt to uh, and uh, make arguments in reference to it. So I'm not seeking to preclude uh, counsel from, from making arguments or from counsel asking questions. What I'm uh, seeking clarification on is, is what uh, exactly uh, and again, this is from a position of, of operating without any information whatsoever as, as to what uh, a defense may be. And understanding uh, that uh, counsel was not required uh, to provide any information until the Commonwealth filed its certificate of compliance. Uh, but there's been, regardless of whether they were required to or not, I, I'm, I'm going into trial on Tuesday without any information whatsoever as to as to who they've spoken to, what they're in, uh, what statements they might be, who their witnesses are, or anything of that nature. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth uh, feels it appropriate to at least file a motion to be given notice as to exactly uh, what the defendant intends to do. Um, this the trial by ambush is simply not something that's permitted uh, uh, by the case law. Uh, and that's what the Commonwealth is seeking to uh, to prohibit in that second motion. Thank you. Okay. Trial by ambush is not something that we're allowed to do. Now, you guys can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong about this, but my impression of the posture of the case and the reason why the defense hasn't produced a lot of this stuff is because the state has been extraordinary, extraordinarily late and delayed in providing their own discovery to the defense. Uh, so this is, again, it's one of those things that sometimes happens in, tri in, in trial and cases and getting prepared, uh, especially when you're dealing with stuff like one of the other issues that came up here, DNA evidence. Um, labs around the country are notoriously backlogged. It can just take a lot of time to get that stuff done. And so sometimes that will be an excuse for stuff to not be disclosed within the time frames that you ordinarily expect it to do. But that said, uh, if you're going to be making claims like that, you really need to have clean hands. You need to show I did everything in my power to try to get this done uh, in, in the timely manner. And it was due to reasons beyond my control uh, that that wasn't able to happen. So to the extent that the defense has not disclosed stuff, uh, it's either because under the rules that we just looked at, the criminal procedural rule 14 for what they're required to disclose, uh, they're not required to, or it's because what they need to disclose is a little bit necessitated on what the defense or what the state uh, is disclosing to the defense. We're having these same kind of issues with the Koberger case, if you're following my coverage on that, uh, because there are just, you know, consistent delays in producing things. And a lot of the defense obligations are kind of dependent on the state doing its part. Uh, so, for example, he's... Uh, 
kind of got this alibi, not alibi, but he isn't able to provide specific information. And the reason for that that has been given in the filings is because, you know, you produced us 51 terabytes of, of evidence, including location data and stuff like that. We need time to be able to review that before we can give you that specific information. So things like that are fairly common when discovery gets held up uh, that that, you know, really creates a log jam down the road. All right, Ms. Jane Eddy, I'll hear you. Thank you. And though they're argued together, I do want you to also start with the third party culprit alone, not third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin, but third party culprit alone, because of all those factors that I told you, as you well know, the case law is clear that I have to consider. And if I had to do it now, and you know I can do a pretrial, right? You know that I can today I can just exclude it. I'm not inclined to do that but I need to be able to make those decisions too. That to me is a big old massive bluff. You know I can just exclude that right here, right now at pretrial. Uh, I mean, if you want to risk violating his constitutional right to present a defense, yeah, you can do that. I mean, this is one of those kind of power versus law <laughs> sorts of issues. The judge has the power to do that, uh, but would that be a legally prudent decision to make? No, it absolutely would not. Uh, so this comes across as a big old bluff to me. She wants to push on this defense attorney. Uh, not entirely clear to me why. I mean, could relate to bias stuff in the case that, that we've talked about. Could be she just doesn't like this lawyer. Could be she has a very specific way that she wants things done in her courtroom and, and he hasn't followed that. So she's going to hold him, hold him to account for that. You know, I'm not going to attribute a, a specific motivation to her because it could be a lot of things. Uh, but that just screams out to me, you know, I could exclude it right now at pretrial. That would be like the dumbest thing that you can do if you absolutely wanted to guarantee that a conviction in this case would be appealed and have an excellent chance of, of getting overturned in light of what we're about to hear about what all this uh, third party culprit evidence is, uh, then you know, no, you absolutely would not do that. And I, surely, surely the attorneys in the room already know that as well. And so this statement comes across to me as one of the ones that's being made for the public. Uh, one of the criticisms of having courtrooms, uh, cameras in the courtroom, and it's one of the biggest criticisms, it comes all the way back to the OJ trial, is this idea that the parties will tailor their stuff. They're not now just presenting to the jury, presenting to the court process. They are performing for the cameras. And I got to tell you, that particular thing right there, to me, that is a play to the cameras. That is something that she said for the public to believe it, not because it actually has uh, any, any weight to it. And I have to believe that the attorneys would have known that. To, in, to weigh those factors, because right now I have zero information. On right. This. I understand that, Your Honor. And uh, that was my plan going into today anyway. Uh, so the, the initial question is, um, why is there a third party culprit defense? Why is it relevant? Um, and we start, Your Honor, with the fact that our forensic medical examiner, Frank Sheridan, um, you know, a pathologist, forensic pathologist who has uh, performed himself thousands and thousands of autopsies, has already submitted a sworn affidavit to this court that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with having been in a fight and are not consistent with having been hit by a car. Uh, since he submitted that affidavit, the federal authorities have provided us with their reports, whereby FBI experts also corroborate that John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with having been hit by a car. They employed experts in biomechanics and kinematics who have reviewed the evidence in this case, and they've confirmed that the physical evidence uh, uh, essentially shows and doesn't show what Dr. Sheridan has opined. So that's kind of big. I mean, we're talking about specific evidence, evidence that this specific killing did not happen in the way that the state alleges that it did. That's pretty big. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily get us to any particular person did that. 
but again, he doesn't necessarily have to show that any particular person did it, especially if all he's doing is just undermining the, the law enforcement investigation here, pointing out you can't trust the conclusions that they reached because they have this whole theory of how the mechanism of death that isn't consistent with the physical evidence. That's just classic, uh, classic impeachment of the state's theory. So therefore, if John O'Keefe was not hit by a car, that means that Cameron Reed did not kill him. And we know that John O'Keefe did not die of natural causes. This was not a heart attack or a stroke. John O'Keefe was injured. He was mortally injured. If he was not hit by a car, as both our expert and FBI confirmed, then he was attacked. And if, if he was not hit by a car, then there is a third party culprit or culprits. So by asking this court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence that others had the motive, opportunity, and the means to attack John O'Keefe, the Commonwealth is essentially asking this court to prohibit Karen Reed from being able to defend herself. So I, I don't think they're asking. So I'm gonna pause right there because that that is that's the point right there. You can't, as a defense attorney, be able to go forward and argue my client didn't commit the crime that necessarily suggests somebody else did it that in and of itself is not presenting third party culprit defense that is just <laughs> exercising your right uh to can you know contest that you didn't that you didn't do it to, to proclaim your innocence uh so there's just no way that the third party culprit defense can be interpreted that broadly to exclude evidence that the crime did not occur in the way that the state alleges that it did, because that would be basically saying, Karen Reed, you're not allowed to say that you're innocent of the case. And that, of course, would be a, a due process violation of the most blatant kind. Asking that you be prohibited from doing that, they're asking first to have you tell them what that is? Right. Well, this is, you know, Your Honor, I'm, I'm getting to that in terms of the, right, so go, the, go ahead. You, the have, you have your that, remarks. That we're either required to give them or not. Um, you know, it is not our job to solve this case for the prosecution. It's our contention. They had the opportunity to do that, but they failed. It is not our job to name a specific third party culprit. We do not have to prove that Brian Albert or Colin Albert or Brian Higgins or some combination of them intended to kill John O'Keefe. We don't have to prove that any of them attacked John O'Keefe such that he eventually died. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't. But the fact of the matter is there is evidence that all three of them had a motive, had they, the opportunity and the means to attack John O'Keefe. Now, the, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Conkey in their motion. And as this court started the discussion on this issue, when you first took the bench, Conkey makes clear that a defendant has a constitutional right to argue that somebody else may have committed the crime. And certainly, no, the acts of that person can't be too attenuated in time or method of operation, as Mr. Lally uh, mentions. But in terms of being the right time period, Your Honor, you can't get any closer than their presence at the scene at the very time that John O'Keefe was killed. And in terms of the method of operation, given that we have evidence that he was not hit by a car and that he was attacked, all three of these men, either alone or in combination, possess the ability to attack him with or without a weapon. I mean, it's a very low standard here. The Commonwealth acknowledges that. It's a low standard of simple relevance. And the evidence here establishes relevance. Now, I would note, Your Honor, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Finney. I don't know if they realize this, but that was my case. I represented Roland Douglas Finney before the Supreme Judicial Court, and I represent. That's always, I just have to stop because I, that's just always super fun <laughs> when you get to do that, when you get to pull that card and dunk and be like, let me tell you exactly why I know how this is going to go because uh, you're citing my case that I made the law on. So, you know, yeah, maybe you should listen to me, judge. It's fun. Sended him at his motion for new trial and at his retrial. And that case, the Finney case, provides strong support for the introduction of third-party culprit evidence here, um, irrespective of a Bowdoin defense. 
Um, in fact, the reason that Mr. Finney's conviction was overturned was that his trial counsel failed to pursue, pursue a third party culprit defense. And Your Honor, the third party culprit defense in Finney was weaker, far weaker than the third party culprit defense we have here. The evidence of motive in that case was that the third party culprit made derogatory statements about the victim after she was murdered. No witness in that case put the two of them together. No witness in that case put the third party culprit at the scene of the murder where the victim was murdered. There was some consciousness of guilt evidence similar to what we have in this case. But in Finney, the SJC ruled that not only was that enough for a defense attorney to present uh, a third party culprit defense, but he was ineffective for not doing so. And as the, the court uh, has also uh, <coughs> touched upon, uh, the, the SJC found that on the basis of that third party culprit evidence, which is weaker than what we have here, there were substantial connecting links between that third party culprit that justified the admission of hearsay in that case. And I wanna make it clear, we're, we're not looking to introduce any hearsay statements. So we're, we don't need substantial connecting links here. Now, Your Honor, I could go through with the court the specific evidence we have with regard to motive, opportunity, and means with regard to the three Commonwealth witnesses that I've named. So go ahead. Oof. Happy to do it. Gotta wonder All if right. she's gonna Starting regret with that. Brian Higgins. He was present at 34 Fairview Road on January 28th to 29th. He was close friends with the homeowner, Brian Albert. He had a prior romantic interest in Karen Reed. He did not expect Karen and John O'Keefe to be at the waterfall, that bar on January 28th. Karen Reed did not greet Higgins, despite the fact that they had previously exchanged flirtatious texts and that she had uh, been at his apartment one evening, although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. At the waterfall, Higgins does not engage with John O'Keefe. He does not say goodbye to John O'Keefe and Karen when he leaves, but before he leaves, he texts Karen, and that text was something to the effect of, um, well, with a lot of M's. Uh, we know that there was a preservation order from this court, your predecessor, Judge Krupp, to preserve his cell phone, and that Trooper Proctor gave an, uh, him an edict um, to, to uh, you know, an order to serve uh, on Brian Higgins, and he left it at the front desk of the Canton Police Station for him, and that Higgins, we learned through the federal investigation, Higgins became angry, demanded that Proctor uh, come back, and he essentially upbraided him and read him the Riot Act, which shows a little bit about Higgins' personality. Um, at the end of the night, everyone discussed going back to 34 Fairview, and when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal grand jury that he had no knowledge that they had been invited to 34 Fairview, but that is contradicted by this text message. And the inference is that he was coaxing John to come to that house. And you know we're not saying this gives him a motive to kill John, but we don't have to show that. Uh, any motive to feel hostility or animosity towards John O'Keefe um, goes to his motive. And Your Honor, when Brian Higgins and Brian Albert are in that house, they're the only two people who are unaccounted for when the rest of the group was in the kitchen. And they claimed that they were looking at photographs together. And we have evidence that they were in the basement. We believe that Brian Albert made a mistake before the state grand jury by testifying they went upstairs to look at photos. Brian Higgins says unequivocally that the only place the two went was into the living room to look at photos and military ribbons, whatever they were looking at. Brian Higgins did not know that Brian Albert had said they went upstairs. And he also testified he had never been upstairs at Brian Albert's house in his life. That means that if Brian Albert said they went upstairs, they're coming up from the basement. And before leaving 34 Fairview, Brian Higgins testified he was parked right in front of the mailbox. He would have had to have walked by where John 
O'Keefe's body was, his headlights when he got in his vehicle would have been illuminating where John O'Keefe's body would have been in the yard if it were actually there. So how does he not see it? So I'm going to pause here just to touch on a couple of things that he has said. So first off, I do got I have to disagree with him uh, in a couple of places. Uh, he said, for example, he's not trying to present hearsay evidence so he doesn't have to show a substantial link. This is getting to uh, another piece of the case law that I'm, I'm not going to pull that up yet. Uh, but it's an it's essentially an exception to the hearsay rule for some of this evidence that comes out with a third party culprit and with what they're calling the Bowdoin defense, the, the evidence of, of bias, uh, you know, the, the police investigation, where even if this evidence would otherwise be inadmissible, you can still get it in. Uh, if it was in the Bowdoin case, if it was presented to law enforcement, uh, because then you're not, it's not hearsay because you're not offering it for the proof of the matter asserted. You're offering it to prove that the police had this knowledge, but then didn't do anything with about, uh, about it. So, uh, hearsay is only when you're offering it to prove that this thing that the hearsay statement says is, is true. Uh, if you don't offer it for that purpose, if you offer it for some other reason, such as it should have put the police on notice to look at this uh, outcome, whether it was true or not, uh, then that is not hearsay and, and that's not subject to exclusion. I bring this up because a lot of the stuff that he is talking about now is, you know, in, in ordinary circumstances, it would be hearsay. Text messages are hearsay. Grand jury testimony is hearsay. Uh, it may be subject to any one of a number of exceptions, um, but he's going to, you know, if he's getting into trial and he wants to present a text message, he, he's going to have to anticipate how does this not satisfy a, a hearsay objection. So the other way around it, too, is with the third party culprit defense, there's a special rule that basically just says, it, you know, we're not going to exclude it as hearsay if it's like really particularly good evidence, if it's if it's got a significant link to like how the the uh, crime went down or or uh, why it went down, things like that. Uh, and so it seems to me like he's saying that's not what he's trying to do here. Uh, he's going to be offering it for a different purpose, but uh, just not not exactly the case that he's not offering hearsay. Everything that he's proffering here is is you know going to be presumed to be hearsay. It's just that there may or may not be uh, be some exceptions to it. Another thing that I, I want to just comment on is is he's clearly advocating. Well, I don't have to show intent to kill and. In general, I think that uh, that is correct, given the circumstances of this crime. Uh, Karen, Karen Reed even initially wasn't even charged with first degree murder. She was charged with manslaughter. This was perceived to be basically an accidental death. Uh, it was only after it went to the grand jury that then it came back and, and they, uh, they alleged that, uh, that, it was, that it was murder, that it's an intentional killing. Uh, but even if the death happened the way that the defense describes that he was, he was beaten up and he died, that's not always a murder offense either. That can absolutely be a, a, a manslaughter type of offense. Just, you know, you were reckless with how violent you were and you, things got out of hand. You went a little further than you expected to. Somebody slipped and fell the wrong way. You, you know, you should have known by getting into a fight that that was a risk that that kind of thing could happen, but you didn't go into it taking your actions with the intent that I am going to beat this man until he dies. So I think he's right as far as that goes. He doesn't have to show intent intent to kill because the, the death doesn't require proof of intent to kill. Uh, so at the same time, proof of something more than hostility, um, you know, it's just, that's where we might get into a little bit of a gray area with where the judge has discretion to decide, is this going to be, is this going to be close enough or is this not going to be close enough? Uh, from my perspective, uh, I haven't necessarily heard a lot to suggest even really that there is hostility. Um, this text message that got sent um, at 12:20 a.m. to John O'Keefe, 
We don't know what that text message says. We may not find that out uh, until trial, unless it's like in buried in some of the pretrial stuff somewhere that I haven't seen. But, uh, you know, he, he hasn't told the judge in this context what it is. So that though, I mean, it sounds like he's saying it could be interpreted as like luring him to the house. If that's the case, it sounds like he's saying it was an invitation. And the other interpretation of an invitation is that it's, it's an invitation. It is not hostility. It is anti-hostile. It is the opposite of being hostile to somebody. Uh, so having this, this prior um, romantic interest, I guess, in, in Karen Reed, is that enough to get to you want to fight her current boyfriend? I'm just not entirely sure that we're there. I think uh, from my perspective, they have a little bit more when they get into the stuff with the Alberts. And as far as these other people who were present, who were potentially involved, uh, you know, he's may, maybe has some, some stronger evidence there that goes more to simply they had knowledge, they had awareness. It's more in line of like a conspiracy or a complicity type of involvement more than that they themselves are, are the ones that uh, wanted to and, and, and committed this crime. So I just wanted to bring that up uh, because you know, we are being advocates here and, and just like the state, you know, kind of goes a little far sometimes, you know, the defense does that sometimes too. Uh, so just wanted to shed some light on uh, those, those comments that he's made. He then goes back to the Canton police station at 1.30 in the morning after leaving 34 Fairview. He claimed to do some administrative work, but then he admitted to the federal grand jury that he was there to move his car because of the upcoming snowstorm. <clears throat> this suggests that he was fabricating a reason for going back to Canton Police to establish an alibi for himself. Um, he was asked several times at the federal grand jury if he had any conversations with anyone before he went to bed. Uh, and when was he notified that John O'Keefe was dead? In the morning, he said. He testified under the pains and penalties of perjury that he had absolutely no contact with any person that night for any reason whatsoever. But he apparently was surprised that the federal authorities had subpoenaed his phone records and he had to admit, and he did admit under oath, he made that 2.22 a.m. phone call around the same, to about uh, you know, five minutes before Jennifer McCabe is Googling how long to die in the cold, about eight minutes before Brian Laughlin, the plow driver, first drives by the house and sees no body at all. And the next morning. So this is this is kind of big uh, that he swore up and down. He had no contact with anybody after he got home. But it turns out there are phone records that show that, in fact, you did. You made a phone call. Uh, huh. That's consciousness of guilt stuff. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of thing that you know tends to tends to create some inferences that you know you have you have something to hide. You have uh, you have a guilty conscience that you are trying to do your best to to conceal other people from from finding that out. Now, again. There can always be multiple interpretations of this stuff. I forgot it's pretty common, uh, or I just didn't think to mention that specific thing is pretty common. That said, given the way that he characterizes this, the context that he was asked specifically in the testimony that, uh, you know, whether, whether he had any contact with anybody, he's given a chance to, you know, think this over and, and uh, you know, give it his, his best opportunity to be honest with it. And as it turns out, uh, is, is impeached with his phone records. So that really doesn't look good for this guy. Again, is this enough to show, therefore he would have wanted to, you know, be involved in assaulting John O'Keefe? I gotta tell you again, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not convinced that's where they have to go. It, it's, it's potentially enough just that he would have knowledge and that he would want to cover it up for whatever reason, whether he did it or whether somebody else did it, perhaps is it's his affinity with the real perpetrator that would give him the, the motivation to want to do this. So not sure that they necessarily have to show he particularly wanted to, uh, to, 
kill John O'Keefe, that he had an interest in covering up who the perpetrator was is, is potentially enough. And so this evidence does seem to be going to that type of frame of mind. Morning, Brian Higgins, the first thing, first person he spoke to was Brian Albert. After okay, he... I'm going to stop you for a minute. I think we need a break, Madam Court Reporter. Do you need a break? Can you go? How much longer do you think you have with this, Mr. Unetti? How many more pages or how long you think? Yeah, I've got about, uh, in terms of my recitation of the facts, uh, I've done about a page and a half and I've got three left. Madam Court Reporter, would you like to take a little break? It's hot in here and you've been going nonstop. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. So we said, well, the judge might regret asking him to go ahead and make this offer of proof of what the third party evidence is going to be, uh, because obviously there is quite a lot of it here and uh, she seems not really pleased with the pace at which he is presenting it. So we get this, uh, you know, sort of inconvenient uh, little break in the proceedings, but that's okay because they pick it back up. And so we'll go ahead and pick it back up when they get back from their recess. All right, Ms. Giannetti, go right ahead. Thank you. Your Honor, I left off with the uh, morning of January 29th. The first person that Brian Higgins spoke to was Brian Albert. Um, he had missed a call from Chief Kenneth Berkowitz earlier. Um, immediately after getting off the phone with Brian Albert, Brian Higgins drives back to 34 Fairview, where he has a meeting with uh, just about all the witnesses in this case, Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and immediately after that friends and family meeting on his day off, which is a Saturday, he returns to the Canton Police Department where he speaks with all of the first responding officers who had anything to do with this case. So this is a quote unquote witness accessing and communicating with all the first responding officers, we would argue monitoring what they're doing in regard to the investigation. According to Brian Higgins, he admitted that Chief Berkowitz is one of his best friends, and that's why he had access to all these people. We have a law enforcement witness who will testify to seeing Chief Kenneth Berkowitz and Brian Higgins alone with Karen Reed's vehicle on the afternoon of January 29th of 2022 for, quote, a wildly long time. So is this a name that's been in the materials? Is this, is this a name known to the Commonwealth? Or yes. Is this somebody known? Okay. We, and we've now received video surveillance from the Canton Police Department that shows that there is an interior camera in the Sallyport garage where the car was housed. But in, during the exact time that that third party officer indicates that Berkowitz and Higgins were in the Sallyport together, the video mysteriously cuts out for 42 minutes between 5.08. So th this is a little suspicious, right? This is going back to that, that tail light evidence and the fact that it doesn't materialize the morning that the, the body is discovered. It, it just shows up uh, sometime later, like the following day, after police have gotten custody, exclusive custody of Karen Reed's vehicle. And so the, the defense, like we pointed out, their argument here is clearly that uh, the the police planted this evidence. They, this is a frame up. That's clearly the defense theory. So missing video evidence at the time when you would see the condition of the taillight of the vehicle when police brought it into their yard. Little suspicious. Between 5.08 and 5.50 PM. And just to be clear here, we never get to see the condition of the taillight when it's brought into the garage. When we do see the car, we see it after Brian Higgins, Chief Berkowitz, Michael Proctor, and Yuri Buknik have all had access to it. At 5.36 p.m., the car pings that it's arrived in the Sally Port. That's during the missing video. 
Trooper Proctor, Trooper Buchnick never sees Brian Higgins' phone. They speak with him and he takes it upon himself to use his own resources, Brian Higgins, within the federal government to ask a friend, Special Agent Mac Kelch, to download only the text messages in his phone between Karen and him and him and John. And that's it. We have to take his word for it that we got all of them. And we certainly don't have any communications between him and Brian Albert, for instance. So this is a little bit interesting too, uh, because it, it goes somewhat to chain of custody stuff. Um, normally, if police need to get your need to get your communications, they get your phone and they do an extraction from your phone, and then they look for uh, what is what is relevant to their uh, their particular search, whether it's a particular time frame whether it's communications between specific people, whether it's a keyword that they're looking for or something like that. So that helps them narrow down what it is that they actually put their eyes on uh, when they're doing the search. At least this is what law enforcement officers tell us because in actuality, what happens is they download the entire contents of your phone. There's not really any, any way to do it otherwise. And then they just promise pinky swear that they don't look at anything besides the stuff that, uh, you know, typically a warrant uh, is, is what allows them to be able to, to look into it. But sometimes it's, for example, you know, you've gotten consent to search and the person says, yes, you can look at my messages between me and so-and-so. That's the scope of your consent to search. That's all you're technically allowed to look at. But there isn't really any way to police that, uh, pardon the pun, to, to prove what it is that they actually look at once the Celebrite does the extraction, spits out its, its, uh, you know, its, its information and categorizes it for you to be able to look at. Police, what they do then is they go in and uh, identify the, the specific things that they want to run a report on. And so, like I said, that can be a keyword search. It can be communications between particular individuals, uh, in communications within a certain time frame, and then the actual report that Celebrite produces is just that relevant stuff. It tells you absolutely nothing about what they actually looked at to be able to get there. Now, the reason why I, I you know, I, I can see, you know, if I wanted to have sympathy for this police officer, yes, I could, because it is a massive invasion of privacy to have police going through your telephone with, especially with this type of um, access. That's really a trust me, bro. You know, we're only looking at the stuff we're allowed to look at. So uh, I can understand he knows this stuff. He is a police officer. He knows how this stuff works. And so he would want to you know, take affirmative steps, I guess, to uh, protect himself from the type of invasion of privacy that, you know, you, you and me, you and me, Joe Schmoes, us, us schmucks, uh, you know, we don't have that option. We don't have special friends at the FBI who can do an extraction for us that we can then hand over to police and say, take our word for it. That's, that's all that there is here because that creates a chain of custody problem. If the police are going to try to admit this and say, these are your communications uh, that were in it, entered at the time, they have to be able to show where they got those. And I got those from you doing, you know, some sort of extraction somewhere with somebody under some method to give us what you say we should have. Uh, that's, you know, not necessarily going to be enough to give me uh, the foundation to prove that these things are authentic. These things are unaltered. These things are everything that are responsive to the request. Kind of what, what, uh, Mr. Yanetti is, is pointing out here. So while I can have some sympathy that yes, this cop doesn't want to be treated the way those peons are all going to get treated when it comes to looking for our cell phone communications, uh, you know, you, you don't, you don't get an exception. Like that's just, that's not, that's not going to be how it works. Uh, your evidence has to be subject to the same standards as, as everybody else's. And if the police can't say, yes, we got this direct from his telephone with our own extraction then they can't really draw any meaningful conclusions from it because they can't say, we know for sure this is everything that's there. We know for sure that this is everything responsive to these search terms or whatever. We can't say for sure that these are unaltered. We can't say for sure that this was a good extraction. So creates a definite chain of problem, uh, chain of custody problem to proceed the way that this police officer did. Instance. 
On February 10th, when he shows up to his interview with troopers Buchnick and Proctor, he brings with them copies of the text that he has deemed relevant in their murder investigation. And he hands them the copies of the extraction that he had his friend do. He then calls Matt Kelch the weekend uh, of this uh, uh, incident uh, to do the limited extraction. He never tells uh, Trooper Buchnick or Trooper Prochner how he extracted the tests, uh, despite the fact that it was done by a friend of his in the federal government. Um, during the federal proffer, Brian Higgins admits that he had been served with a preservation order and the Commonwealth told him he could destroy his phone despite the order. A lot of big stuff here. <laughs> A lot of big stuff here. From the proffer, Brian Higgins told us that uh, he had knew about this order, that he was to preserve it, and the Commonwealth told him he could go ahead and destroy it anyway. Uh, this it's like where 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 do we even start with this? Um, obviously, the fact that you're destroying evidence that there was an order for you to do is bad. This is consciousness of guilt stuff. That you're doing it with the explicit permission of the state authorities who are subject to this order, who have ethical responsibilities as officers of the court, are telling you that you can do it. That is spoliation of evidence, and that's you know, misconduct. That is significant misconduct. And then we have this key word there in the beginning in the proffer. Okay, let's talk about proffers. So what a proffer is uh, with the federal government is when they are investigating a crime and you are potentially going to be indicted for something, you are a target, you are a suspect, the FBI may offer you the opportunity to flip, okay, to be the one who goes ahead and, and informs on the other people that they are targeting the higher priority people or something like that. And so that is typically accomplished by way of a proffer. What you do is you have a, a specific agreement that spells out, okay, uh, it's a non-prosecution agreement, for example, uh, you know, we have probable cause to believe you committed X, Y, and Z crimes, um, Sometimes they'll, you know, go into detail about why, other times just, just not necessarily. Uh, and we are going to exchange not prosecuting you with your truthful testimony about X, Y, and Z that, you know, that will basically help us prosecute these other people. And so then the proffer is the way that the defendant carries out their end of the deal. And there are specific rules about this because <clears throat> they set this up so that a proffer uh, can be done in a way that it can't be used against the person who is making it. Uh, so it's basically like a free call <laughs> to, the, to the FBI to be able to tell them what you know, uh, and that isn't going to be able to, to be used to, to prosecute you in, in another action. Kind of like a limited immunity, basically, for, for that conversation. <clears throat> so the fact that this is phrased as a proffer, uh, to me, definitely confirms that the investigation here is, you know, fo focusing in on law enforcement people, because it suggests that Brian Higgins himself was potentially a, a target of this investigation, uh, and that he would have, you know, reason to need to make a proffer to law enforcement to get some, some kind of deal. But also just, again, just what I just said, like it, it potentially puts a target, you know, it marks him as somebody that, uh, potentially the feds were interested in, in pursuing and pursuing charges against and potentially cut a deal with, uh, I suspect, you know, given that Mr. Yanetti is an extremely experienced criminal defense attorney, uh, he knows this sort of technical meaning of what a proffer is, particularly when you're talking about the feds, um, then, you know, I don't think that he chose this word lightly. I don't think he was probably using this word colloquially. Uh, I, I, you know, have to believe he, he chose this word pretty specifically. So, that is really saying a lot about this federal investigation that's been going on in the background, where it's at, who it's looking at, and who may be potentially in a position to provide evidence that is beneficial to the defense. 
He then drives to a military base on Cape Cod, opens his phone, breaks the SIM card, and throws the phone away. And he says that he discussed destroying his phone with Brian Albert. Brian Albert also destroyed his phone. And Brian Albert uh, said that he had uh, received some text that concerns him as an explanation. And after that, Brian Higgins changes his phone number and changes his cell carrier. In short, he was present that night. He had a motive and there is plenty of consciousness of guilt cover up evidence with regard to Mr. Higgins. Moving on. So just gonna pause here to say, yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is pretty good stuff that there is more than meets the eye going on with this particular individual. And not just that, uh, you know, he's suspicious or he's weird or he's, you know, otherwise be behaving uh, inconsistently with innocence in ways that are specific to this crime. Remember, that's the whole problem with all of this is making sure that it's specific to this crime and not just, well, but it could have been, or, you know, that, that guy seems like a, like a weird one. Maybe it was him. Uh, specific actions to cover up specific involvements relating to this specific killing. Yeah, that's pretty strong stuff. On to Colin Albert. Shortly before January 29th of 2022, Colin Albert lived with his parents, Christopher Albert and Julie Albert, on John O'Keefe's street, just two doors down. We have evidence of bad blood between Colin Albert and John O'Keefe. We have evidence. How old, how old was Colin Albert at that time? I believe he was 16 at that time. Okay. We have evidence that Colin Albert and John O'Keefe used to get in confrontations because Colin Albert used to cut through his yard without permission and John O'Keefe was not happy about that. History of confrontations. Now we're getting a lot closer to why would one of these three people potentially want to beat up John O'Keefe? We have evidence that Colin Albert used to throw beer cans intentionally into John O'Keefe's bushes and John O'Keefe was not happy, happy about that. We have evidence that Christopher and Julie Albert knew of this conflict. We have evidence that they referred to John O'Keefe uh, as Nebercracker. That's a character from, a, I think, a kid's movie uh, who was known as the get off my lawn guy. When John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were vacationing in Aruba over New Year's Eve 2022, the Alberts, Christopher and Julie, taunted him. They went to his porch and they had photos taken of themselves drinking on John's property when he wasn't there to do anything about it, evidencing they knew how upset he was at what Colin Albert had been doing. Now, the investigators in this case, Your Honor, including Michael Proctor, kept Colin Albert's name completely out of the police report. When this case began, I had no idea who Colin Albert was. Um, I received a tip right from the jump that Brian Albert and his nephew had beaten up John O'Keefe. I didn't even know Brian o Albert had a nephew at that time. I just wanna pause here to point out, I find it interesting, he says, I got a tip from the jump. And of course we don't know who that is, we don't know who that's coming from, but that is a tell that there is likely somebody the defense has that is going to be a witness that is going to tell them uh, what 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 happened now it's possible this is just a hearsay tip you know somebody heard from somebody who heard from somebody that uh that this is this is the way that that uh john o'keefe was killed in which case now you got those hearsay problems again you have to be able to come up with uh with something that would justify bringing that in but again, remember that exception we have with the Bowdoin defense. If that information was presented to law enforcement and they didn't investigate it, then it comes in because it's not being used for a hearsay purpose. So that's a pretty good tip to have in your back pocket. Uh, if you don't, in fact, you know, if it's not like an eyewitness who was there, who has given him this information and is going to testify for the defense, uh, he might still be able to get it in as this tip simply because if he got the tip, you know, one of the things I would be thinking strategically is, well, I'm going to be telling the state this stuff because they need to know it. They need to follow up on it. 
and then you, you, you see what they do. And if it turns out what they do is nothing, uh, then you've got a pretty solid Bowdoin defense right there. But after receiving the tip, I learned of the conflict that Colin Albert had with John O'Keefe. So I sent a letter to Mr. Lally, I believe by certified mail. I knew that the DA's office was planning to present evidence or witnesses to a grand jury. And at that early juncture, before anybody uh, had been had asked them to indict, um, I notified the DA of three potential suspects, the ones that I'm talking about now, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, and Colin Albert. Um, after he received that letter at our next court appearance, I'm sure Mr. Lally can confirm this, um, he acknowledged that both Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be testifying or had testified before the grand jury, but he questioned why I included Colin Albert in my letter. He told me at the time that he had no evidence that Colin Albert was there that night. However, after receiving my letter, lo and behold, multiple witnesses testified that Colin Albert was at 34 Fairview <clears throat> the night of January 28th to 29th. And now the DA will argue, I'm sure, at trial that he left before Joan O'Keefe arrived. We don't find their evidence compelling. We don't accept it. We are not required to accept their theory of the case. We're entitled to present a defense. And so what he's getting at here, what it sounds like is that the Commonwealth is gonna put on witnesses who are going to say, oh yeah, he was there, but then he left early. And that's, I mean, fine and good, but you don't have to believe those witnesses. The jury doesn't have to believe those witnesses. It all needs to be considered in the totality of the evidence that's presented to them. And so when the jury is evaluating people's credibility, they're going to look at, well, how consistent is this with everything else that we've seen? And so what he's really getting at here is that, you know, the idea that Colin Albert left the scene when he is the one that had the motive to, to, to do this, you know, to do this beating, the specific one that had the motive to do this beating, uh, and whatever other circumstances there might be surrounding his presence or, or non-presence there, like are there inconsistencies in the stories about, you know, when he left, why he left, where he went, stuff like that. Uh, those things can all undermine why the jury would be inclined to believe that he left the scene. So that seems to be where the defense is going, is that they're, they are acknowledging that the state's going to say he left, but they are saying we're going to challenge the credibility uh, of those reports. His presence at 34 Fairview gave him the opportunity, along with the motive, to harm John O'Keefe. With regard to Brian Albert, Your Honor, um, this is a well-connected, well-known, powerful family in the town of Canton, Massachusetts. Brian Albert was present at that home when Colin Albert was there. <coughs> Colin Albert is a member of the Albert family. He's nephew of Brian Albert. We have evidence that Brian Albert had expressed hostility toward John O'Keefe as well. And we know that he initiated a phone call with Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning. He reached out to Brian Higgins. And then he picked up the phone when Brian Higgins came back and they spoke for 22 seconds, and they never revealed any of that to investigators. Again, consciousness of guilt, and perhaps most of all, Brian Albert is a first responder. He is duty bound to help somebody who's in trouble. He was notified that John O'Keefe was in trouble. Brian Albert stayed in his home. He knew what was going on outside. His sister-in-law was out there, civilians, medical personnel eventually arrived. He did nothing. That is also consciousness of guilt. Now, Your Honor, with regard to all of that third-party culprit evidence to admit it substantively, which I would assert to the court is, is both overwhelming and powerful. With regard to the Bowdoin uh, argument here, the police investigated none of that. That didn't come from the Commonwealth. They had a, a complete lack of curiosity as to what was going on in that house that night. They didn't care. Investigators never went in. The feds investigated. 
And that's where we got a majority of this evidence. So, you know, to, to the extent that the Commonwealth now claims that they didn't have notice of this, um, I, I beg to defer. They, they got notice of this when we got notice of this. Uh, you know, the Finney case, Your Honor, again, I'm, I'm well familiar with it. It stood for the proposition that, you know, if, if you want to point the finger at a third party culprit, you've got a constitutional right to do that. And if you want to point out inadequacies in a police investigation, you have a constitutional right to do that. It is for those reasons that I ask you to deny the Commonwealth's motions. Okay, thank you. Any response, Mr. Lally? So, yeah, there's there's quite a lot there. Th this is this is now his proffer, and so given what we have seen so far about the standard, where do you guys think we're at? You think you think they've cleared that bar? You think they've not cleared that bar? I got one more case I'm going to show you guys um, just so that we can have a little bit more context about what the standard is going to be here. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and get it up. This one is uh, Commonwealth versus Silva Santiago. So this is another one that was down there in the notes to uh, evidence section 1105 on the third party culprit stuff. And so in this particular case, uh, there had been evidence that somebody else told the trooper, uh, somebody who had been present at the scene, told the trooper that a specific other person, a man wanted for a couple of other homicides, uh, had shot the victim that night. Uh, and so the defense says this is relevant because the police didn't follow up on it. They didn't uh, show, didn't include his photograph in any of the photo lineups or, you know, do anything with that partic particular information. It was just a tip that died. The Commonwealth objected saying this is hearsay and you're trying to get it in front of the jury to argue that it was, uh, you know, there, there for its proof. And the judge agreed with that. The judge said, no, it would be hearsay. Uh, and unless somebody is going to testify that this particular guy was the shooter, um, he isn't going to uh, be able to uh, rely on that information. I, apparently the person was not actually an eyewitness. They had just been present at the bar that night. Uh, and, and, uh, so didn't, didn't see it happen, but tipped the police. Hey, this is, this is the guy that did it. So the defense makes it clear, uh, word of mouth in the community was that he had done it. He was wanted for a couple of other homicides. She wanted to use this information to impeach the investigation of the officer. So this is a great case for going in between, going into the distinction between the third party culprit, I'm going to point the finger at you and say a specific person did it versus this Bowdoin defense, which is I am going to, uh, generally speaking, uh, present evidence that, that the police um, fail to follow up on investigative leads and that that constitutes reasonable doubt in the conclusions of their investigation. So here is where we get into these special rules uh, for hearsay with this type of evidence. With the third party culprit evidence, uh, it says if the evidence is of substantial probative value and will not tend to prejudice or confuse, all uh, doubt should be resolved in favor of admissibility. So here it says, because the evidence is offered for the truth of the matter asserted that a third party is the true culprit, we have permitted hearsay evidence that does not fall within a hearsay exception, only if in the judge's discretion, the evidence is otherwise relevant, will not tend to prejudice or confuse the jury, and there are other substantial connecting links to the crime. So that was what Mr. Yanetti was talking about when he was saying, uh, I'm not offering hearsay, I don't have to show substantial links. My view is he may or may not have to do that. It's just going to come down to what specific piece of evidence are we talking about at the time and what specific purpose is it being offered for at the time. If it's something that's coming in because he's trying to impeach a witness, then yeah, uh, he may not have to. Uh, but if it is something he's putting on in his case in chief as proof that somebody else uh, perpetrated the offense, then yeah, he might have to be able to make this link. That said, if he can make a substantial link, he can potentially present hearsay evidence that otherwise would be excluded. It, it wouldn't fall within uh, one of these other exceptions. 
Uh, so that was, it's just an interesting little nuance of, of this particular defense uh, in Massachusetts that came out of came out of this case law. I was not familiar with that. We don't have that in Washington. You know, hearsay is hearsay and it's accepted or it's not. Uh, there's no like special rules for it, depending on whether you're talking about a third party culprit or not. So then with evidence that the police investigation was inadequate, it's equally admissible, but different in the inference it invites. While the inference to be drawn from third party culprit evidence is simply that someone else committed the crime, the inference that may be drawn from an inadequate police investigation is that the evidence at trial may be inadequate or unreliable because the police fail to conduct the scientific tests or to pursue leads that a reasonable police investigation would have conducted or investigated. And these tests or investigation may have led to significant evidence of the defendant's guilt or innocence. A jury may find a reasonable doubt if they conclude that the investigation was careless, incomplete, or so focused on the defendant that it ignored leads that may have suggested other culprits. So again, that's just that fine distinction between what you're doing in, in these different contexts, pointing the finger at a specific person as, as you did it versus pointing the finger at police, you didn't do your job. So in this particular case, information regarding a third party culprit uh, whose existence was known to police, but whose potential involvement was never investigated may be admissible under a Bowdoin defense, even though it may not be otherwise admissible under a third party culprit defense. So in this particular case, a guy at the bar who didn't see it saying word on the street is it's this other person, that in and of itself is probably not going to meet those standards of motive, opportunity, and intent. It's just word on the street. It's it's kind of gossip. I mean, word on the street can be a lot of things. Not to, you know, bang on the bell with Koberger again, but my goodness, you know, word on the street was like, there was every word on the street when uh, that first happened before uh, before he was he was arrested and charged with the crime. There was all kinds of speculation. There were thousands of tips that were sent into law enforcement. Uh, none of that stuff is in and of itself really particularly helpful to prove a particular person did it. It is literally just gossip. So it's very, very unlikely to meet that third party culprit standard, but you can use it to, to meet this Bowdoin standard to show Police had this information and they sat on it. They didn't do anything with it. And had they followed through on it, it may have given them what they would be looking for uh, to either rule in or rule out this defendant that has ultimately been charged with the crime. So they explain the reason why this is not offered for a hearsay reason. It's not offered to show the truth of the matter asserted, but simply to show that the information was provided to the police. So it's not hearsay. It doesn't have to meet the uh, hearsay standard. <clears throat> and then the risk from uh, to the Commonwealth that it's going to be unfairly prejudicial to them uh, to admit this stuff under a Bowdoin defense, that's less because police are able to explain what they did to determine that the suspect is not guilty of the crime. I really like the way that they phrase this because it just emphasizes that the burden of proof always remains on the state. It always remains on the prosecutor and the investigators who are the ones pointing the finger at a specific defendant and trying to deprive that defendant of their liberty. Uh, they're the ones that have the opportunity to be able to decide what investigative leads are followed or not. So if they have an explanation for why they didn't follow these leads, great, let's hear it. And I'll tell you what, I'm really looking forward to those explanations in this particular Karen Reed case. So let's go ahead now and get back to the final part of the hearing where we hear again from the prosecuting attorney. Uh, brief <clears throat> um, just first, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just 
mere speculation or saying that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, I, I do find it somewhat interesting that Mr. Yanetti uh, wrote apparently four and a half pages of notes but didn't have time to write a motion uh, to admit uh, the evidence uh, that he claims that he has. Um, he references in regard to uh, third party culprit, uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. He's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which was then refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom. This DA sure is coming across as salty. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's always a big tell when an attorney has just presented uh, loads and loads of evidence uh, when somebody gets up and says there's no evidence. There's obviously evidence. We just heard about it. Now, not everything that he said was a specific offer of proof of a specific item of evidence. He did generalize certain things uh, just to sort of be able to explain uh, his version of events. But no evidence. He talked specifically about prior grand jury testimony, about stuff that's on video, about stuff that's in text messages, about stuff that was extracted from cell phones, uh, about, you know, e even this thing that he first goes to, goes to, which is a medical examiner's report. Uh, these things are all evidence. So to say that there is no evidence and just speculation uh, no, like that, that is going beyond what is kind of normal advocacy, uh, and is just sort of like angry tantruming. That's my read. Now, I also want to point out that what he is doing here is particularly from my perspective, it's particularly ineffective because he's just pointing out there is a factual dispute here. One expert says one thing, but the expert says things that are inconsistent with stuff that another expert says. Yeah, welcome to the world of litigating with experts. That's 100% normal. It happens all the time. It doesn't mean that what the expert says is inadmissible or, uh, or not. All they have to get at here uh, for the defense to be able to meet their burden is to show we have evidence that if the jury believes us, if they side with us, if they find it credible, if they find it believable, then they would be able to conclude this other person had motive, intent, and opportunity to be able to commit the crime. Uh, they don't have to, you know, disprove every possible state counter argument to their evidence in order to be able to present a defense. That is not the requirement to be able to, you know, pre-qualify this type of evidence. So we're kind of back in that situation where I'm getting the impression that a lot of this is just for the cameras. This is not legally significant. This doesn't matter to the ruling. He's just trying to deal with the massive bomb <laughs> that Mr. Yanetti has just dropped in his courtroom with this extended recitation of uh, facts and information that he, you know, tends to think is going to prove that Karen Reed is innocent. This man wants to prove Karen Reed is not innocent. Uh, so yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna take issue with all that stuff that Mr. Yanetti just said. But this is not the trial. This is really not the opportunity to be doing that. Uh, nevertheless, you know, it's not objected to. He's, he's going to have a chance to, to be able to say his piece. Uh, I just point out that I think this is performative. Uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> the council references the federal grand jury materials in which, uh, I would say, uh, as has been done numerous times previously is, is severely mischaracterized as to what they actually contain. Uh, so what, uh, the, and it's not a crash reconstructionist as it's been alleged here before, it's a biomechanical engineer. Uh, and essentially I just got to point out, he, he did say biomechanics and kinesthetics. That's what, that's what Unity said. He, he didn't say crash reconstruction, or if he did, you know, he specified exactly what he was talking about. So again, this is just kind of nitpicky in a, in a weird way. Essentially, what they did was take painstaking lengths uh, to go to uh, to determine that uh, the defendant's vehicle did not strike uh, Mr. O'Keefe in the back of the head, which is simply something that no one has ever said, intimated at any point ever. Um, 
there is also a medical examiner uh, in the federal materials who concurs uh, completely with Dr. Scordy Bellow's uh, findings as it pertains uh, to the cause and manner of death. So with regard to each of these, the other thing that I would point out is, is counsel was uh, counsel record with the Finney case. The Finney case relates to third party culprit under the Bowdoin event. So it's not applicable to what counsel uh, was arguing. Um, it is a low standard, but it's also one that the defendant here has not met. It's not one without limits. Uh, as it pertains to much of, of the material uh, that it was uh, summarized uh, as far as uh, speculation as to what different things uh, counsel feels mean uh, from from various uh, things regarding Mr. Higgins, uh, Colin Albert, and Brian Albert. Various things, meaning evidence, various pieces of evidence that he has offered from which he is drawing inferences, which is just going to come out and say it. That's how you make a case in the courtroom. We're just starting with Colin Albert because that's frankly the easiest. He wasn't at the house, and that's what the federal materials confirm with each of every single of the witnesses that were spoken to by uh, the district attorney's office or the troopers or testified to the state grand jury. They testified to the exact same things in the federal grand jury, that Colin Albert had left the house prior to uh, the defendant and the victim arriving there, and there's absolutely nothing uh, to combat that whatsoever uh, other than, again, just rank speculation. So opportunity. Well, nothing to combat that except rank speculation. Again, this is going too far. The fact that they said it does not mean the jury has to believe it. It's not definitively established <clears throat> simply because the state's witness said so. Particularly, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> particularly if the defense can point to reasons why they should not believe it. You don't have to. You can just say you you shouldn't believe this information. It's not credible for any variety of reasons. Um, but, you know, that's going to be a weak position. The state's going to be able to come back and say, oh, well, but this was sworn testimony under oath and they were under penalty of perjury and very impressed with the seriousness of it and had every incentive to uh, to tell the truth. So you got to assume the defense is going to be able to have something. They're going to be able to point to inconsistencies in the grand jury testimony, inconsistencies between the witness accounts, other facts and circumstances to call into question the complicity of those witnesses in this cover-up that they're alleging. Uh, and if they can point to, the, to any of those things, really, then yes, they will have a very, fairly decent argument to a jury that this is not credible. Therefore, you don't have to buy it. Therefore, it's not established. So that's why even though it's not a formal standard that in this context, you kind of take the defendant's word for it, that's as a practical matter, ultimately how it works out. We understand all of these things are going to be disputed and you know that that's, that's why you have a jury. That's their job is to sort out who do we believe, who do we not believe, what's the, what's the, what's the ultimate fact that, that we think... Uh, can actually be established in, in light of all this evidence that we're given. Uh, if they buy the defense version, is there enough? That's really what they have, have to get at. And so, you know, him continuing to poke holes in the defense version here is all fine and good, but really this is an undertaking for trial. This is not an undertaking for a motion in limine. Opportunity would be a little bit amiss uh, if he's not even there at the same time uh, as Mr. O'Keefe, regardless of, of the invalidity of any sort of, uh, you know, ill feelings or ongoing feud uh, that's purported uh, from whatever unknown evidence uh, counsel claims to have. In regard to Mr. Higgins, uh, that, that, that was a fanciful story. But again, there's actually no actual evidence. That was a fancy story, but there's actually no actual evidence. Well, <laughs> actually, <laughs> you can you can almost see him like just struggling to come up with words to, to contest this massive flood of very specific things that we just got from Mr. Yanetti, the proffer, the, the destroying the cell phone with the SIM card, the doing your own extraction with your FBI friend, the uh, testimony about, you know, not, not, uh, not having any contact with anybody, then being impeached with your own phone record showing that you had a 2.22 AM call with, with Brian, uh, Brian Albert. I mean, <laughs> yeah, 
it's just not not credible such a tell when they say no evidence uh that probably means there's actually quite a bit of evidence of of most of those things uh or at least the the imputations or the connotations uh the council wants to put uh behind uh that um whatever he feels uh things were observed um so Again, I'm not sure where the evidence uh, from this is coming from. Uh, what I'm also a little confused in regard to is that if counsel is merely relying on materials within the federal grand jury um, and just learned of them at that same time as, as we learned of them when uh, materials were provided pursuant to TUI, uh, then it's a little peculiar that the exact same arguments uh, were being made throughout the pendency of the case well, well, well before uh, counsel was provided with any of those uh, federal materials. This is uh, not as clever as I think he, he wants it to be because he's trying to say, well, you've been making up this stuff all along and uh, therefore, you know, it's, it's weird that, that, uh, that, that we only got this, you're only relying on this in the two E stuff. Well, no, that, that would tend to confirm that the defense theory that they were getting through evidence that was not admissible initially early on uh, was correct. <laughs> and so I want to pause real quickly here too, just to emphasize how, what a big deal this TUI stuff is. So we haven't talked about this at all so far, but this was actually one of the very first things that grabbed my attention with this case that told me, oh, wow, this is something huge that's going on here. So like we've been talking about, there has been a federal investigation going on According to Mr. Yanetti, targeting uh, Michael Morrissey, but at the very least, we know it's involving these same sorts of facts and circumstances surrounding the death of John O'Keefe. So when a defense attorney or a prosecuting attorney wants to get access to, for example, you want, uh, you want to subpoena something that they obtained in their investigation, or you want one of the FBI agents to testify about information that they got or, or anything along those lines, uh, the feds don't have to comply with the state court. And the reason why is because the federal agencies have uh, sovereign immunity to suit from the states or from state court participants. So basically you cannot, you cannot sue the government unless it gives you permission to do so. And so TUI is referring to a case that basically is uh, saying that the way that these disclosure obligations then will work is that the departments will adopt policies for when they will and will not cooperate with requests for investigation. And so then as long as they follow their policies, uh, you, you don't have, that's the only mechanism that you really have to be able to enforce a request for information is saying under the Administrative Procedures Act, you have these specific requirements that you have to follow. You didn't follow them. Therefore, uh, you know, you, you, you made the wrong decision and you should give me the information. And that's basically these processes are known as the TUI process. And so what happens is, Say I'm the defense attorney. I want uh, I want some DNA evidence that the the FBI collected. I send them a subpoena for the DNA evidence. Uh, if I just send them that subpoena, they're going to ignore it, and they can ignore it, and I can't do anything to enforce it. If I try to sue them in state court to enforce it, they're going to remove it to federal court. Say, hey, federal court, we have sovereign immunity. Throw this suit out, and the court is going to do that. So I have to follow their process. And with the Department of Justice, what that's typically going to involve is I have to send them an affidavit that details you know, what it is that I'm looking for, why it's relevant to my particular investigation. And they are going to then review that affidavit and see if the information that I'm looking for is something that can be disclosed, disclosed or if it falls within some type of exception to exclosure. And so the big exception to disclosure anytime you're dealing with federal law enforcement is the investigative privilege. This is ongoing. If I reveal to you this information, it's going to tell you about sources uh, or evidence or um, methods and techniques and things like that, that could tend to jeopardize our, our own investigation. Uh, so extremely uncommon in a law enforcement investigation for anything at all to be released. 
And yet in this case where there have been no federal indictments coming down from this investigation, uh, something in the ballpark of 3000 pages of stuff, including grand jury materials telling us that at the very least, you know, there, there, there was an investigation. There was a grand jury process, uh, people, they were seeking to charge people. Maybe the grand jury just didn't return any indictments. I guess we can't rule that out. Or it's possible that this grand jury is ongoing. This is a continuing process that hasn't been resolved yet. And nevertheless, the feds turned over 3,000 some pages of their own investigative materials without really apparently any objection at all. Uh, this is big. <laughs> okay. Just to me as a defense attorney, this is like unprecedented, unheard of. They always object because they can. And so, you know, why, why wouldn't they? That's the first thing that really got my attention that there is a lot more here, uh, that meets the eye, especially with all of this stuff that is going on behind the scenes with the federal, the federal investigation that's going on. So big tell for me, this, this two -y things. Let's go ahead and uh, conclude Mr. Lally's presentation. Um, what the council just went through is essentially a list of rank speculation and not actual evidence. Um, as far as the mysterious uh, portion that's missing uh, from the, the Sally port, there's a number of different, it's, it's a motion activated camera for the most part. The other thing that I would uh, direct the court's attention to as it was contained within the state grand jury proceedings uh, is there is cruiser camera video from the Canton police cruisers. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from cruiser 682. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from cruiser 682 at 822 in the morning uh, when a lieutenant and sergeant from the Canton police on their own go over to One Meadows Ave, which is the, the residence of Mr. O'Keefe, to do a well-being check because they had not received any information as as to how the children were or if they were there being attended to. And they pull into the driveway at 822 in the morning, directly behind the defendant's vehicle, which is exactly where Ms. McKay parked it when they stopped there to see if Mr. O'Keefe was there before then piling into Ms. Roberts's vehicle and proceeding to 34 Fairview. And what you can see within that cruiser camera video at 822 in the morning is the damage to the right rear taillight of the defendant's vehicle. Well before the defendant had then come back to the house after the hospital and then gotten in three separate cars with her family and driven in a blizzard all the way back to her parents' house in Dighton. And then the vehicle had then been towed from Dighton back to the Cannon Police Station uh, by the state police with the assistance of the Dighton police. Do you know what exhibit number that is before the grand jury? I believe it's 56, but I, I, I maybe I, I can certainly locate that information. So again, just to pause here. Okay, there's going to be a factual dispute about when and how the taillight was broken. The defense says we can prove it wasn't broken. The state is saying we can prove it is. None of this means that the state can't or that the defense can't present its third party theory. It just means okay, we can anticipate that the prosecutor is, is going to rebut that when it goes to trial. But this really isn't pertinent to the legal standard that the judge is going to have to consider in whether or not this third party culprit stuff is going to be admitted at all. This is just pre-litigating the case for the cameras. And again, as far as Brian Albert is concerned, I, I heard nothing other than he's apparently in a well-connected family in Canton and Colin is his nephew who wasn't present at the house when Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed were present at the house. So again, I think it's a stronger argument, certainly if, if we're trying to bootstrap onto a Bowdoin defense uh, and counsel will probably likely be allowed to uh, at least investigate that as far as impeachment, cross-examination, things of that nature, but there is absolutely nothing beyond just a, a fertile imagination and rank speculation as it applies to a third-party culprit defense. And for that reason, uh, the Commonwealth's motion to exclude it should be allowed. So there, there it is. That's the conclusion. Rank speculation uh, is, the, is the Commonwealth's takeaway uh, after we heard you know, fairly extensive amount of amount of evidence of a cover up. So Judge Canoni did not rule on this motion. She has taken it under advisement. 
Uh, my prediction is this. Uh, I think that with respect to the Bowdoin stuff, uh, almost certainly all of that is going to be allowed in. It has to be allowed in because you have to be allowed to impeach the defense investigator, the police investigation for bias. And so uh, most of this stuff is going to be, you know, relevant to show why police, that police didn't follow up on it. And then that creates the inference of why that's where the defense theory comes in. Why didn't the police investigate this stuff? Well, because they and their friends are implicated in it. So you don't necessarily need specific evidence that says they're implicated in it. If you can draw that inference, if that's a reasonable inference that, that you can draw from those particular facts. So, uh, the question is really going to be, is this a reasonable inference that's specific enough to this case and to this evidence? Uh, I, I think that they are pretty clearly going to clear that hurdle. With respect to the third party culprit stuff, this I expect uh, she's going to probably take it under advisement, meaning she's not going to really rule on it at all. Now she has a general idea of kind of what the parameters of the defense are anticipated to be and what the parameters of the state's case are anticipated to be. And they will just need to deal with it in trial as it comes up. It's not likely to come up in the course of the state's presentation in the first four weeks because that's all going to involve cross-examination and impeachment. So it's information that is offered for different purposes than just, I'm putting this on to prove that a, a third party uh, committed, committed this particular offense. So the smart thing to do, the only real prudent thing to do here, in my opinion, is you, you just wait and see what you get. You wait and see what the evidence is when you go into the defense case. Then you see what specific evidence, what particular pieces of evidence the defense is going to want to call in order to, if that's the direction they're going to go, to point the finger and say these particular people did it. Uh, See what is already in the record that tends to support that and then look at what specific things they're going to offer that would tend to show that. And then based on that, you're in a much better position now to be able to make a ruling that will be a lot more likely to withstand appellate scrutiny than if you just rule something off the cuff right now, like you suggested at the beginning of the hearing. I could just exclude all this right now. Well, that would be extremely imprudent and uh, very likely reversible. You know, we could probably anticipate the kind of defense proffer we would get on like a motion to reconsider in light of that. Well, now we'll get all of those statements and all of that evidence and stuff. So that's pretty much my prediction. Uh, I think they're going to have real broad leeway to go there with the boat and stuff with the actual pointing the finger third party culprit might be a little bit narrower, but I think she's going to hold off on making that ruling until they have a more specific showing at trial. So this is set up to go uh, starting tomorrow, I guess. Jury selection is, is going to start. Uh, it's anticipated to be pretty long, like I've said, about six weeks. So I don't expect that I am going to live stream the entire thing. Uh, We'll probably uh, be, be paying attention to it, though. I'm going to gonna do my best to uh, watch it and just keep track of things as they go on. Uh, if there are pieces that are particularly interesting and compelling, uh, then I might uh, try to anticipate those, live stream those. Uh, so do feel free to hit me up, especially those of you who are, you know, way further in the weeds with the facts and stuff in this case than I am necessarily. Uh, if there's something coming up that you know, like this is going to be a big part of the case, definitely let me know I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll see if I can uh, work that in and maybe get that live streamed. Uh, things like, you know, when Brian Higgins, if Brian Higgins gets called to testify, you know, in light of what we heard at this hearing, I think I'm going to probably want to hear that. And uh, same thing with obviously Karen Reed. If Karen Reed testifies, you know, that that's going to be very interesting to hear. But all in all, this is one of those trials that uh, it really does not look like a foregone conclusion what 
the outcome is going to be. Um, from what I have seen, there does seem to be a lot of stuff that the defense has to work with here to establish reasonable doubt. I, of course, don't know all of the ins and outs, every detail of the state's case. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that all of that stuff has been made public anyway. Uh, but just going by like what's in the probable cause affidavits and stuff like that, it's not, you know, necessarily the strongest case. It's not like anybody saw this happen uh, and, you know, is, is saying that it happened. There does appear to be some forensic evidence. Uh, how strong that is going to be is yet to be determined. There seems to be some competing forensic evidence on the defense side as well. And with this, I'm talking about things like the uh, vehicle black box and, uh, you know, the taillight pieces, damage to the bumper, something about possibly a hair on the bumper. So a lot of this stuff, it's just going to get fleshed out in trial and we'll see what the significance is when we get it. Uh, but it's definitely been enough to capture my attention. So I will be following closely. Uh, I just want to go ahead and bring up this super chat. The taillight doesn't matter if he wasn't hit by the car. Where is the dog? Yeah, if he wasn't hit by the car, I mean, the only reason the taillight matters is because they're saying that the taillight is, is proof that he was hit by the car, that she hit him and broke her taillight and you know, hit him hard enough to kill him, but apparently left injuries that look like he was beaten up. I mean, you know, boxer's fracture. I don't know how you get a boxer's fracture from uh, getting hit by the car. I mean, I guess it's not impossible, but it does seem a little bit weird to me. And by the way, I, I did see that autopsy. I seen the autopsy photos, obviously not sharing them here. Uh, I guess YouTube doesn't like that, which is understandable. Uh, but yeah, he's got, he's got, I mean, it is classic. It is a classic boxer's fracture. You break, you know, the, the metacarpals on this, on this part of your, part of your hand, uh, because of how, you know, how you make the contact and this stuff is all weak and it breaks. It's, I mean, it's a boxer's fracture. They literally call it that for a reason. So yeah, that was a little weird and, uh, just, you know, some stuff that is going to have to be explained. Where is the dog? So the dog is a question because he's got, he's got injuries on one of his arms that my understanding is the state is saying that it's road rash, but it doesn't really look like road rash. Uh, it's, it's, it's sharp looking. It's very uniform. Like when I think of road rash, you know, you've gotten dragged along the gravel. It's like a big abrasion, like whole big chunks of skin missing and stuff like that. And this looks more like specific scratches. And so the defense theory is that uh, the Albert's dog uh, did this. Another thing I noticed from the autopsy photos, it kind of looks to me like these may have been post-mortem injuries. I don't know if there's been any um, talk about that or not, but because they're, they, they are just abrasions, but there doesn't seem to be any bruising or swelling associated with them. And so normally, like if you're alive and you, you know, you like somebody cuts you or something like that. I mean, there, there's a pretty instant, you know, inflammatory response, but you don't have that response once you're dead. And so, uh, injuries like that where the skin is broken, but there isn't, uh, there isn't swelling or, or, uh, bruising or anything like that, uh, that can often indicate that this is a post-mortem injury. But anyway, the defense theory is that, uh, it was a dog bite, uh, that the Alberts had, a a dog that they have, I guess, since gotten rid of this dog. They had made statements that the dog had not ever been involved in previous biting incidents, but apparently had, in fact, from an animal control, the defense has gotten records that the dog had, in fact, been involved in previous biting incidents. So all of this is just kind of more... <laughs> More of the of the big questions of, of how all of this came about. Um, we heard Mr. Lally mention in, in his section that uh, well, dogs have dogs have teeth on both sides of their mouth, and the marks are only on on uh, one side. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not a dog expert. I don't necessarily know what's from a claw and, and, you know, how, how exactly, you know, biting might work where they could, you know, potentially penetrate on one side or the other. I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll have an expert on that. That's, uh, that's beyond my expertise. But he also said, like, very definitively, well, it doesn't matter. There's no DNA. Uh, there's no dog DNA in the bites. Well, this is a very common fallacy. Of course, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, the fact that there is no DNA on a wound uh, on a man who has apparently been sitting out in the snow for, you know, potentially a few hours before he's recovered uh, it's not like a necessity that there would be DNA on the wound in that situation. A um, whole lot of variety, variety of factors that go into whether DNA is deposited somewhere at all. Uh, but also it's, you know, environmentally degradable, um, being out there exposed to the elements, you know, that would seem to me to be a perfectly reasonable way for any DNA to, you know, be washed away to otherwise just be too degraded for there to be anything of use. So in that particular case, he wants to use the absence of DNA as proof, evidence of absence, proof that it couldn't have been a dog bite. Uh, but I don't think that that inference necessarily follows. Uh, hi, will you be live streaming the trial? Well, like I, I just mentioned, this one is going to be uh, a bit too long <laughs> to really cover the whole thing. Uh, and uh, for another reason, I'm just about to get into um, it's not going to work to do the entire thing, but I do want to keep an eye out for like the good parts <laughs> and stuff that we already know is, is going to be, uh, is going to be interesting, is going to be compelling and potentially have, uh, you know, a, a big bearing on, on the outcome of the case. Um, some of the key witnesses and, and stuff like that, I definitely want to, uh, want to follow that. Real quickly, I got to answer this one here. Um, this is going to be such easy work for Mike Tyson, okay? This is going to be uh, a timing exhibition. Uh, Jake Paul could not keep Tommy Fury off of him with his jab, okay? For like the fiercest pressure fighter, counter puncher machine uh, that Mike Tyson was in his prime. I don't really care how old he is now, man. You know, some of those skills and those instincts, uh, they're not going to fade. So I got I got Tyson uh, having easy work. Anyway, and you guys following boxing, boxing, that's about the uh, Mike Tyson fighting Jake Paul. So I do have an announcement, uh, which is something that I've been very excited about. It's been in the works for, for some time, and I finally get to put it out there now, which is that I am starting a Substack. Uh, I have wanted for a long time to find a way to be able to get access to some of these trials that are not televised, because I think like many of you, uh, for at least a decade, if not longer, um, I have been trying to watch, just follow journalism on legal cases and found it's just generally terrible. It's not accurate. Uh, it misunderstands basic things. And it's because most of this is being done by people who aren't familiar with, they're not legally educated. So they don't know what the rules are. They don't understand necessarily the process or the significance of what they're looking at. And so you just get a lot of bad information in general with court reporting. It's a lot better now with the prevalence of, you know, more cameras in the courtroom or live streams and, and things like that so that we're able to see stuff for ourselves. But there's still a lot of important cases that are not televised. Um, nearly everything in federal court is not televised. And even in state court, it's like, you know, case kind of case by case. It's up to the judge whether they're going to put it out there or not. So there's a big gap there for information. And so that's what I'm hoping to achieve here. Substack, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like Patreon, like locals. Um, it's a subscription service that you can sign up for. Uh, and it's going to be primarily for me, it's going to be primarily a, a paid service. Uh, so I'm going to produce a lot of my content there. I'm going to do a lot of long form written stuff where I do more of this deep dive things that, you know, you, you can't really put into 240 words on Twitter. 
Uh, and I'm also going to premiere a lot of my video content there. Lives, I'm not going to do. I'll continue to, to come live on, on YouTube just straight here. Uh, but when I make a video uh, on a, a particular subject, something that I pre-produce, uh, I'm going to premiere it on there. I'm probably going to do some exclusive stuff on there as well. Uh, and so the reason why is because I want to be able to go to courtrooms and bring you this reporting. It's badly needed. And I'm going to start in Indiana with the Richard Allen case. So it's booked. I'm going. I will be there. I will be reporting from the courtroom, whether people subscribe to my sub stack or not. But if you did, <laughs> it would be an enormous help. Uh, great big support to, to be able to do that kind of work and to keep being able to do that into the future. I really hope there's going to be enough of an appetite for it. Uh, and so if it is, that's something that I uh, hope to be able to continue to bring to you. Uh, but I, I mentioned that in part because that is, of course, one of the reasons I won't be following this whole uh, six week trial with Karen Reed uh, in, in the live stream is because starting in May uh, is the Richard Allen trial is going to be starting. So there's going to be some overlap there. Uh, and I will absolutely be doing a lot of in-depth coverage on the Richard Allen trial. That's another one. I haven't talked really about it at all on my channel. I've talked about it on some, uh, some appearances on other people's channels, but that's a pretty wild case. Uh, I'm going to be doing some, some introductory stuff to just let you know uh, if you're not familiar with it, what's going on there, but it's another situation similar to Karen Reed where uh, it's a murder charge and there are some very peculiar circumstances that uh, tend to suggest there might be more law enforcement involvement, more of frame up type of situation uh, than you would probably hope in criminal cases. Uh, one of the standout things in that case for me is that uh, Richard Allen, the defendant has been held pre-trial uh, in prison <clears throat> in solitary confinement for somewhere approaching about 600 days now. So extremely unusual uh, position for a pretrial detainee to be in. It has, according to his attorneys, had some very significant effects on his uh, mental state, um, alleging he's, he has had, uh, he's had psychotic breaks and, and things like that, which is, you know, not necessarily uncommon from, uh, periods of like long periods of solitary confinement. It will literally drive you crazy. That is implicated in statements that he has made that the state is planning to introduce at trial, which, from what I can tell, seems to be really some of the strongest evidence they have against him that he is the perpetrator is that he said he was, but these statements occurred in the context of him having these psychotic breaks and apparently providing information that's not at all consistent with how uh, the crimes were committed. And there has been some other evidence of third party culprit stuff involving uh, some kind of weird pagan ritual cult, which is just bizarre. This Odinism cult uh, that involves runes and twigs and rituals and strange things. But apparently uh, prison guards who are guarding Richard Allen, some of them wear patches that associate them with this Odinist cult. So very weird stuff. Uh, it's one that has been under a pretty tight gag from the court as well. So the full extent of the information is really not out there. It's not going to be developed until trial. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's extremely important to have good, reliable reporters in that courtroom because that's going to be the only way to find out what's happening and to be able to evaluate, is this a fair process that's happening over there or not? Uh, we're not going to be able to see it ourselves from the, the courtroom stream. There's not going to be any cameras. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, if I am relying on the mainstream media uh, to tell me what's happening in a case, uh, I lost my trust there with Depp versus Heard. And that's just kind of the bottom line. So 
those are my big plans. That's my big announcement. Uh, if you want to take a look at what I'm doing, it's substack.andreaburkhart.com. And uh, I hope you'll take a look. And if you like what you see, please do consider subscribing. That's really going to be my only pitch. Uh, I don't want to like spam people with, you know, buy my stuff, join my thing or, or whatever. Uh, so I will, of course, continue to be here on YouTube, presenting stuff on YouTube. Uh, don't worry at all if, you know, if you if you can't subscribe, that's totally fine. Uh, I will still be here. I'll still be commenting on Twitter and everything if you uh, follow me there. So with that, we're going to get into jury selection tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to be listening. Don't know if there will be anything to report on, but just wanted to give you guys a heads up. Yeah, I'm very interested in this trial and in seeing how all of this fleshes out. Uh, it is quite unusual. It is uh, just... Not often that you see a case uh, like this with so much already out there in the public record that is uh, indicative of a pretty strong defense case for reasonable reasonable doubt. So I'll be very interested to see how it all goes down. I'll be watching. I'll be coming in to let you guys know what I think. And uh, as always, hit me up if you have things that you, particular things that you want me to look at, or um, like I said before, if there's specific witnesses or evidence that you know is going to be a big deal in this case, fill me in. I'm still, I'm still getting up to speed on what's going on. And so I'm really happy to pay attention and do what I can to cover all of that. So with that, thank you so much for joining me on this live stream today. Uh, it's been a, it's been a minute. I'm ready to go have some lunch. So please do enjoy the rest of your afternoons and I will see you guys next time.